Vinny Tortorich here. Hey, man, if you're a fan of Izzy, you might be a fan of me, too. I'm the guy that gets people to lose a lot of weight. I have something free for you guys. This is no clickbait. Just go to VinnyTortorich.com, and there's a big banner. It's a free PDF, How to Lose Weight. It's an intro guide to NSNG at VinnyTortorich.com. Go check it out exclusively for anyone who listens to Izzy Presley. Thank you. RockstarLeatherworks.com is your home for badass rock and roll gear. Featuring 100% handmade leather bands, watches, cuffs, bracelets, and more, Rockstar Leatherworks has something for everybody. Whether you are going to the show or you are in it, you can find something to fit your needs. Choose from a variety of designs or create your own masterpiece. Their bands and watches are second to none. They also ship international. Who needs a stage to be a rock star? Check out rockstarleatherworks.com. Hey, ladies. Sass Pants Designs will take that band shirt that everyone has and make it your own in a flattering, sassy, and simple way. There are one-of-a-kind tank tops, halter tops, lace-up tees, and tube top dresses already in stock. Check out the online store at sasspantsrocks.com and like Sass Pants Designs on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for special offers and custom orders. Use the code IZZY25 for 25% off of your entire order at sasspantsrocks.com. That's sasspantsrocks.com. Let Sass Pants make you the envy of the party. Replay Guitar Exchange is your premier independent guitar store. Being independent is good. With all of the major brands, including new, vintage, and pre-owned, you can find the guitar, bass, amp, or accessory you are dreaming of. From vintage to the newest models, Replay Guitar Exchange can help you find that perfect piece. They have industry veteran expert staff, all players like you, down to the owner. You aren't just getting a great guitar, you're getting the Replay difference. Find them online at ReplayGuitar.com and find your dream guitar today. Hi, this is Bobby Brown, and welcome to another fucking podcast. My liver's all twisted up. But you know what I did? I loaded up with alcohol. More specifically, vodka, whiskey, beer, tequila, more beer, more vodka, more whiskey, and more beer. Who wants an orange whip? Orange whip? Orange whip? Three orange whips. So you're bored, are you? I've come here to break your monotony. Let me have my piece, because I'm shooting with this one, folks. I don't care, man. The unscripted, uncensored, loose cannon of commentary. Why did you say that? Why? Why? Can you come out with stink like that? Poop. Your poop mouth. Poop out of your mouth. See, son? Old legends never die. They just lose weight. Like a legend and an out-of-work bum look a lot alike, daddy. I've got a midget friend, an albino friend, and another friend who thinks Lord of the Rings is real. Together we call ourselves the Unfuckables. Which time is in? Let the fun begin! Party touch! You got you an asshole, man. <laughs> I've never heard of Van Halen. Hello, Hollywood! Hello, world! Hello, my loyal minions. It is good to see you, and as always, good to be seen. Is he Presley? I have returned. It is another fucking podcast, and I have the beautiful and talented Carrie Stevens on the show this evening. She will be joining us shortly. Oh, man. Been off for a couple weeks. It's great to be back. Did a cross-country road trip back to Minnesota, driving through small towns, not having to wear a mask, walking into stores except for Walmarts, of course. Or if they requested it, that's fine. You do it. It is what it is, but we all know how it goes. Um, yeah, so it's great to be back. Vegemite is disgusting. That's right, fucking Ward. Anyways, yeah, I had a great time. I had a good time driving across the country, seeing my parents, seeing my old friends, and uh, seeing a lot of places that I didn't get to see. Um, make sure you guys do hit up all the social media at Real Lizzie Presley all the way across the board, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you go to the Instagram, you see lots and lots of photos of this belt. That's right. The winged eagle all the way across the country having fun with it. Because why? I am a dork. Uh, you guys can donate to the show. Izzy Presley at yahoo.com is your PayPal. Real Izzy Presley is the Venmo. And dollar sign Izzy Presley is the cash app. If you guys like what I do, very, very appreciate it. Or you can buy shirts, buy merch, and just hit up that 
that uh, Teespring store. The link is right on the Another Effin Podcast page, which is Another Effin Podcast on Facebook. Yada, yada, yada. So, so, um, before Carrie joins us, um, I want to, I, I need to get something off my chest. And uh, you'd think, you'd think, you know what, we're going to do a shot. We're going to do a shot right now. I've got my Jack Daniels and we're going to get fired up for this. Mm, yes. Oh my God. Look at this. And uh, while we are doing this next week, the drunken summit returns and we are sticking in the kiss vein, trying to do at least one kiss one a month. It will be two, what a lot of people consider turds or a lot of people consider vastly underrated we are doing another album showdown this time we are doing dynasty versus unmasked that is right carrie is here but but we will get to carrie we will get to carrie in just one second there she is oh look at that beautiful face we'll get to you in a second all right carrie i got i gotta i gotta get this uh i don't think your audio is on by the way um let me, uh, let me see if I can do this. Participants. Uh, no, it says it's on. Well, we'll get it figured out in a second here. So I got, um, I got this, uh, I got a little, um, a comment on one of my old shows. Cheers, by the way. Cheers. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Good. Nobody else can, but I'm going to unmute you. Just, I so just before you unmute me, I was just listening to the uh, Space Lady. Uh, we could do a whole show based on that. I was just I, just, I had to stop where she was asking how large, he was asking how large the vibrator was because I had to come to you. But um, <laughs> Well, you are, that. trust me, the more you listen to that, the more you're going to want to listen to it because it is just a train wreck. No, no, I know a lot of people in that, that like I know, I've, that's why I can comment a lot because I know a lot of people personally that yeah. she mentioned throughout one of them I saw at the post office yesterday, big Chris that supposedly, you know, uh, tore up her, you know, vandalized her house phrase. I swear just yesterday, I, I heard a voice behind me at the post office. Hi, Carrie. And I'm like, and it was him. And it, Mike, Mike Super is a good friend of mine. I'm going, Oh my God, this is so weird. Anyway, that's funny. I'll that's say funny. If you want to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but I, I'm very excited to talk about, and I must crack a beer. My delicious, Mick Golden Light, which I brought all the way back from Minnesota. Really? So, beer? of course. It's one of the reasons I went um, to bring back <laughs> beer, because I can't get this beer out here. So, uh, I had a, a listener comment, mm -hmm. a quote-unquote listener, because I don't know who the fuck this guy is. And his name is, uh, hold on, his name is Chris Henry, and he commented on an old show, and he said, um, uh, what the hell are you eating? Your show sucks by well chris part of me just wants to go into sid hartman mode and any minnesota people know exactly who sid hartman is and go what do you do for a living sir but the bottom line is chris i don't care i'm well, glad you don't why like is he listening to your show if it sucks so much i i, I don't know but i look i i'm glad you don't like me because i don't need you no. i don't need the negativity look we get it that's what YouTube comments are. That's what Facebook comments are. That's no, what that, tweets that, are. People attention. One time I let loose a little on someone who said something rude to me on Twitter, something similar to what was said to you. And the guy responded, wow, I just sent it to see if I could get your attention. That's so amazing. You wrote back to me. And I wrote, you know what? You catch more bees with honey. And then I blocked him. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, uh, sometimes that's just what you got to do. But I have more fun doing it like this because Chris, I get it. May I? Yes, I've been Whatever doing this show. Real name is. I, yeah, sure, Chris Henry. We'll go, Chris Henry. I've been doing this show for seven years. There's a reason I'm still doing the show. There's a reason that I am taking taken very seriously in this world, even though I don't have Corolla type numbers. I don't have three sides of the coin top type numbers. But you know what? I do what I do. If you want fucking hacks, 
Go ahead. Listen to fucking hacks. Listen to that hack down in fucking Florida by the name of Dr. Fuck out of his fucking mom's basement who can't even get a sentence out properly. Go listen to that phony up in fucking Montreal by the name of Mitch LaFond. And yes, I am shooting on this one because Mitch, if you're listening, I know you and I know people who know you and I know exactly who you are and you're so bad. You can't do a fucking proper interview and you had to bring in some famous producer just so you can get fucking numbers. I do it real. And look, I get it. I bought this fucking belt out of a box of gimmicks off fucking eBay. It is what it is. But hey, you want that kind of shit? Go listen to that shit. You want good stuff? You come to fucking Izzy Presley right here on another effing podcast. And look, I get it. I'm on three sides of the coin all the time. They want me to fucking be their gimmick monkey dancing boy eating in the background well hey they got it this week i caved that's right i fucking caved they, they got their wish i'm now their gimmick dancing monkey boy eating on this week's episode of another of uh three sides of three sides of the coin but it is what it is anyways i had to get that off my chest chris good knowing you pal have fun <laughs> Ooh. all right and that's the bottom line, because Izzy Presley said so. Anyways. That's so now, the beer you got. That right you have to bring me some, but <laughs> some whatever you're on. This is what happens when you get a dork that's a comic and has been on the radio for years or was on the radio for a couple of years and been doing this for seven years, can talk in front of people and watches too much fucking wrestling. You get this right here. Anyways, um, the star attraction. Her name is Carrie Stevens. She's an author. She's an actress. She is a playmate. Miss June 97? 1997. Yeah. And uh, yes, KISS fans know her as the girlfriend of the late, great Eric Carr. And if you see in the background, you probably can't see it because of reflections, but I got Crazy Nights behind me. The vinyl. So Carrie, you have a brand new book, which is right here called unrated that's right unrated revelations of a rock and roll centerfold you guys can get this it is available now hardcover is now available uh amazon and barnes and noble I, i'm uh, correct you know they change it every day i know our hardcover is definitely available at barnes and noble now and paperback is definitely available on amazon and they're both available on my website and very soon i believe within days you know amazon will both have hardcover and paperback Excellent. Um, and actually, I did get this question. Let's get this out of the way right away. Uh, Marshall commented on the Instagram post wondering if uh, autograph copies are available. And you are doing that. So uh, please explain yeah. if people want autograph copies of this great book. Yeah, they're available at carriestevens.com. And I have VIP packages. Izzy got one. Um, there you get. Um, you, I autograph your copy. It's numbered and it comes with a bookmark that's also uh it's a trading card and eric Carr's sister made them for me actually and that comes with the package and then i email everyone that orders them a photo of me signing the book so that you know it's authentic so there you go there you go marshall i'll, I'll make sure you have the link for that as well um the one <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie to you. I honestly, I did not have time to dive into this, but I did listen to that podcast that you were on the Shout It Out Loud cast. Uh, so you so, didn't have time to read my very intelligent, well-spoken uh, book, but you would love to listen to trash like everybody else. But I, <laughs> I, I admit it, I listened to the trash too. Um, and it was quite entertaining. So yeah. every, if there's time to read my book later, it's in your hands. You can. Yes. Oh, no, absolutely. No, no, the, the only... The, I'm Carrie, just honestly, there, I, I know you're giving me shit, but the, honestly, the only reason I did not have time to do it is because when I came home from our little meeting yesterday, um, I, I literally came home from Minnesota with a carload of shit, carload of boxes and shit, and my entire room was filled with it, and I had to get it organized and almost put away. The reason you can't see it is because it's all pushed out I of camera. I just like you, though, as soon as I get home from a trip. I cannot stand it if there were if like I have to unpack immediately, put everything away immediately. I have to get right back to normal. I can't leave things around. Yep, I I, I had to get it around. Oh yeah, and just so you know, I did wear them just for you. Oh god. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I just think the photo should be flipped a little. Yeah. No, I get it. But I'm perverted. I just thought you flip it to the other side would be a little more suggestive. 
well, you know, it, yeah. it, look. Yeah, so uh, I was listening to the foxy, spacey lady, whatever. Um, I have mixed feelings on it, really mixed feelings, because I have all these guys coming at me, sending me the link, like, oh, this chick is crazy. She's nuts. She's, and at first, you know, I thought, yeah, she must be crazy. But after listening to it, I have to say there's some things in it that, um, she's not just, she's not a complete liar. I believe she's speaking emotionally for sure. She's oh, yeah. operating on, on, and I don't know if she's quite sane. I think she should have thought that through a bit, especially if she's claiming that her life is in danger and she thinks Ace is going to have someone at the house to kill her when the podcast is over. Right. Um, th that makes me think that, you know, how seriously can you state, take that statement? Right, um, right. Uh but then again, maybe she's really getting it out there so that if anything does happen to her, then they'll know exactly who to go to. Mm -hmm. That maybe she's her way of protecting herself. Look, I don't know Ace at all. I have no opinions about him. Um, the first thing, when the, which, um, you know, the guy that interviewed her seemed to be so shocked over um, this rumor about Paul Stanley's niece really being uh, his daughter. That rumor, uh, Eric told me that, like, when I was... His girlfriend 30 years ago like really day. yes no it was oh that was an open rumor like we all knew it and, and so this is funny to me that it's coming out now like she's it, she's exposing some explosive secret that was always a secret within our inner circle that's not new i'm not saying i know if it's true or not i'm just right. saying it's the same thing as the guys as the roadies calling paul phyllis behind his back i mean everybody knew it that's not new news um right. but and so that's the that's the kind of thing where like I had sort of forgot about that rumor, but mm -hmm. when she said it, I was like, oh yeah, everybody knew that. That's nothing right. new. I mean, of course, no one's gonna, I wasn't gonna tap Paul on the shoulders and go, oh, excuse me, is that really your daughter? I right. mean, I, it, but it was a rumor back then and, and within the close-knit circle. And it's not, um, I, 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 and I did disagree with her saying, and it's not because I am a fan of Jean. Jean, Jean's reputation back then was always that he liked older women. So right. her accusation that he likes 12 years, 12 years old, I found that to be unbelievable. Yeah, I've never yeah. heard anything, uh, it, as a matter of fact, just the opposite. Gene likes big breasted women and older women. Yeah. He was the opposite. Most guys like young girls. So I never heard that about Gene. So, mm -hmm. and I also didn't think, I'm getting opinionated already. I, I didn't think it was fair of her to say, oh, he knew Epstein and all those people. You know what? I know all those people. It's like, I didn't know Epstein personally, but yeah. I knew a lot of those people. I knew Steve Bing very well, um, Ron Burkle, all those people that are, you know, now a a accused by association of, of um, so just because Gene knows Epstein, it's like, you know, if you're in a certain circle, everybody knows everyone. Right. It doesn't mean Gene's a child molester too. I don't, right. I don't think just, I think a lot of those people that went to Epstein's island may not have even known what was going on. Right. You know, I, I'm not an expert in that whole thing. I'm just right. saying a lot of those people actually did do business deals together. We know Gene cares about money. So mm -hmm. he probably um, might have been working with them in some way. I wouldn't, I, I don't, I, I honestly didn't even know him and Ace were friends. For, so for her to be saying, oh, Ace is worried that Gene's going to go to jail over a 12 year old, that part sounded far fetched. And right. then she had me at the dildo up to ask, shit like he doesn't know how to make love he only wants a vibrator up his ass now this is like holly madison writing her book about oh poor me i you know was trapped at the playboy mansion for eight years oh uh, well you know what what's her name Re whatever a space lady like she did not have rachel, to rachel gordon her. yes rachel she did not have to put a vibrator up his ass for 12 years nobody right. stuck a gun to her head and said stay with me and stick a vibrator up my ass and put the nurse costume on so at that point that's when you kind of lose me like she had me in the beginning going no i've heard some of these rumors and mm -hmm. you know i understand like if, if you are loyal to a guy and then he is powerful and as you kicked out of your home and like yeah i you i would be out of my head too i would i would be emotional um right Right. I understand. I believe her that the police came. I believe things happened to her that were not fair. Um, but then when she got, she really got me with, well, how, and he's asking, well, how big was the vibrator? It's like, come on, do, do right. we really, how, what is the purpose of this information? Mm -hmm. And 
and I don't, I don't think she lost to me when she took the, the, their intimate sex life details and bashing him as a lover because mm -hmm. one minute, you know, you were his wife and you loved him so much and the next minute, like, you never wanted to have sex with him. I mean, that he, he doesn't know how and he wants a viper. It's like, that just sounds like, um, it almost sounds like it was work to you. Like, what are you, right. a wife or a prostitute? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm not saying any of this to bash her. Like I said, right. there's several things that I say she's not a liar. There are rumors right. I heard too. But there's other things like, like she was talking about Mike Supa. Mike Supa has been a very dear friend to mine. He's a former cop, a former cop, a good friend of Ace Freely. He's been a very dear and good friend to me for, I don't know, 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. Maybe he has a different relationship with Ace than he does with me, but I don't know the guy to have a bad bone in his body. He's never said anything racist to me. He's helped my son from the time he was a little kid, like get into music. And, you know, he's just, I know him to be like a really good guy. He raises his daughter on his own. Like he's a really good guy. So I, I just thought, wow, it's unfair. She brought his name into it. And right. like I said, the other guy, Chris, I don't know very well, but I ran into him in the post office yesterday and I'm like, Hmm. Okay. This is all like, it's getting too close now. Like seriously, like she's saying this guy, Chris, like was, uh, you know, beating her walls down. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, basically doing Ace's dirty work. And I'm like, yeah, that's Mike's friend. He was, he did security at the Kiss Expo a couple of years ago. We sat on the airplane together. I ran up to him in the post office yesterday. You know, he seemed pretty harmless to me. Then again, you know, like, no one sent him to my house to fuck things up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have contra I, I have conflicting opinions about the whole thing. But like yeah. I said, I was fully into it until she had to get into. Oh no, that was the podcast interview. How big was the vibrator? Right. Right. Like, do right. We really need to know. I think we've heard enough. Exactly. You know? Yeah. If anybody out there is wondering what we are talking about, there's a podcast that came out. Oh, I believe it was up. yesterday. Um, where Ace, Ace Frehley's ex, Rachel, um, going off. And let, we have to say allegedly, because we do not know if any of these things are actually true. And that's the one thing that the podcaster miserably that's failed. True. She, she says, she has picked, I thought this was strange. She said the police showed up at her apartment, you know, uh, and they, you know, she had to get out. You're not getting out fast enough. You know, and they're, we're cuffing you because you're not getting out fast enough. Well, and she said, I've got pictures and I've, I've got videos. Uh, where, while the uh, police are surrounding you with guns and threatening to threat you, I mean, threatening to cuff you, when do you have time to pull right, out your right. phone and take pictures and videos of them? Right, you right. Know, you know, or you'd have to interview her, not me, uh, to get the scoop on that. But th those are the questions I would ask if I were to interview her. That's uh, well, I tell you what, that is a path that I am not going to go down. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I don't blame, uh, I don't blame the... you. I'm just saying, I, I don't, I appreciate you having me on, but you know, I, again, I wondered the purpose of, uh, of her coming forward with. Yeah. With well, I mean, you know, like she's, she's saying shit. Like uh, if you guys didn't hear it, like um, Ace and Paul used to room on the room on the road. Ace would get hammered and pass out and wake up to Paul blowing him. Who you cares? Know? Honestly, exactly. I don't care. I could exactly. care less if Paul Blue Ace. I'm sorry. Right. It doesn't affect my life. Exactly. It affect the, the, how I feel about their music. I, I, who, I, this was a very long time ago. Yeah. Honestly, it, it doesn't matter whose dick got sucked to me. It doesn't affect exactly. my exactly. life or my outlook on the world one way or the other. That's why I said, what is the purpose of releasing this information? Mm -hmm. Well, this is the other thing too, is we've all heard the rumors about Paul being gay for years. It doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, we don't I can't care. Remember whose book it was in, but well, didn't somebody write a book, Peter or Ace or something, saying that back in the day when in the 70s or something, they were so fucked up, they didn't know who they were with. They were doing each other. Someone told me that and I don't remember whose book it was in. But again, I, I didn't really care. I just figured, okay, people on drugs and things happen and who cares? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, going to the uh, comments really quick. Tony, Tony from uh, goddamn Rockwood Saloon popping in saying, hi, hi guys. I Miss your faces. Tony. I plan on getting on Carrie's book. I plan on getting Carrie's book, but I haven't 
I have to wait to get it in person from her after the COVID calms down yep. and we can have you over. Tony does not live very far from me. We can arrange that, Tony. And I'm actually wearing some of your rock wood, rock wood designs. Uh, well, there's chapter 11, under chapter 11, I'm, heading, I'm holding your Eddie Van Halen guitar that I borrowed and wearing one of your rock wood saloon nice. shirts. Nice, and actually, chapter 11, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But, you know, Corey, Carrie, what I want to do, uh, because I haven't had a chance to read this, I did listen to the uh, Shout It Out Loud podcast that you were on. Um, I listened to that this afternoon. Was- Very good interview, by the way. Um, but I, I want to do this kind of like a, a track by track gimmick. So we can go down each chapter and you can give a little, you don't have to give everything away so people can uh, actually buy it and read it, but kind of give the idea of the chapter. But I mean, I have other questions. Don't worry, too. There's no way I could give any, everything away. Like in, in however long you're going to talk to me. It's, I could have written 11 more chapters easily. Um, I fit my whole life into 11 chapters. I have no idea. It, so in the very beginning though, um, you talk about uh, Me Too and you talk about Weinstein. Um, yeah. do, do you have Me Too moments? Do you have Weinstein not moments? Not a lot. Not, not a lot. The reason that I, I brought it up is because, um, you know, I, a Hollywood Reporter had tweeted about Oliver Stone sticking up for Harvey Weinstein. And mm-hmm. impulsively, I responded and I said two of a kind you know I remember the time he grabbed my boob when I was walking out of a party now I didn't think my little tweets were paid attention to the media but that went viral all over the world every media outlet picked it up um, and they all wanted to talk to me and they all wanted to quote me saying that um, Oliver Stone honked my boob like a horn then they, they refer to me as 48 year old playmates was a couple years ago now this this happened, mind you, I was about 23 years old. I was a playmate when I was 28. So I was not a mm-hmm. playmate, but he was honking my horn. Again, I was just a girl at a party. And I really didn't mean to publicly accuse him of anything. I just um, tweeted, thinking no one pays attention to my tweets. Right. Um, so, but that was a catalyst for um, more that happened through the book. Uh, and it made me that uh, the media giving me that title 48 year old playmate i didn't right. like it and it made me say who am i i'm what what have i contributed to the world and is this what i'm i've amounted to that's it uh, uh, and so it prodded me to examine my choices through life i wanted to know how did i end up here and so i went back and i and that's what all my don'ts are about and uh, yeah and, and that's one thing i do like about all the chapters it's everything is don't you know that's how they start but let me ask you this carrie do you do you think um is being a playmate a double-edged sword do you think that uh obviously it doesn't hold you back as far as porn does but do you think that you know the playmate mantra the playmate label holds you back moving on into not, a not, career no, uh, in film? definitely not now um i'll never know if it, I'll never know the answer to that because I was an, a serious actress long before I was a playmate, but okay. I wasn't getting work. You know, I, I, I studied in New York and you can read my book and find out all about it. I don't want to yeah. bore you with all the details, but I went the serious acting route. You know, I had my hair cut, like, you know, the little Jennifer Anesty choppy do. I, I tried to be, you know, the serious actress. I wasn't getting any work. And I was hostessing at, at a, high-end restaurant trendy place in LA where all mm-hmm. those girls hung out like Pamela Anderson was a part owner Carmen Electra Jenny McCarthy they were all in there all the time and I just I kind of thought I wondered you know I'd go to auditions and I'd be up for these hot, hot girl roles um but I, I I didn't know if I could be one and then right. it was kind of like a challenge to myself and so I decided to trans my transform my image. I'm still the same old girl I was, that same small town girl. And the playmate is a role I play as a character. Okay. So yes, I, I became, I, I took on that role. And when I did, doors started opening and I had this little test to myself. I was up for one of those one line as the hot girl roles on Polly Shore show. He had his own show, Polly on the Fox network. And yeah. I got a call back and I told myself, okay, 
if I get this, because I'm in line with all the hottest girls in LA, if I get this part, that means I'm ready. Because I'd been like working out, growing my hair out, like trying to be like more sexy. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I booked that role. And that's when I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to test the playmate. And immediately doors opened up. I got playmate. I, I didn't even have to go to auditions. I went straight to callbacks. I, you know, I didn't, modeling jobs just came to me. I mean, I, I was busy, busy, busy all the time. So it definitely worked for me. And I have, I won't regret it because I've had an extraordinary life full of adventures that I would not have had had I not been a playmate. But right. um, yeah, I was seen uh, as, you know, that character that it worked well for me. That character I developed worked well, but I was mm -hmm. definitely seen as that character. Um, now I think it's been enough time um, you know, being older is better now for me for acting. Unfortunately, COVID's kind of put a wrench in that. But um, in January, I started getting very acting, very serious about my acting career again. And the type of auditions that I get now are not the hot girl with one line. Right. You know, I'm getting some serious roles. And, oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm being, I'm not being typecast anymore. I can be the mother or the lawyer or the doctor. Yeah, right. You know, I can do other things. So it's, I'll never know if it affected my life back then, mm -hmm. but even if it did, it doesn't matter. My life was great. So what year did you move to Los Angeles? 89. 89. Were you trying, um, were, were you trying to do the video Vixen gimmick? Were you trying to get in the music uh, videos? No, not at all. No, I didn't do my first. Oh yeah. That's a lie. Sorry. It's not a lie. I almost forgot. I did do a music video. Um, uh, Lizzie Borden was my first music video. I was 19. Really? Yeah. Um, we've got the power. And okay. I was, yeah, Google it. It's actually been like named as like one of the top five worst music videos of all time. And I'm in like the top number one uh, voted worst movie of all time, like Birdemic 2. So <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, that, that was only 19. I'm sitting like in a green cubicle. We've got the power. You can find it. Um, That's awesome. And then in, I think it was 1999, I starred in Third Eye Blind's Never Let You Go. But that, oh. was, that, no, that was 2000. That was 2000. So okay. I was not part of the 80s, late 80s, 90s. Like I wasn't part of the Bobby Brown crowd. Like I wasn't hot yet. Like I was Eric's girl. Well, I dealt that. Well, I was just, I wasn't, I wasn't playmate hot. I was just like kind of, behind the scenes, like small town girl, you don't really notice, but if you if you start to talk to her, maybe you'd think so. But I wasn't like, you know, famous or anything back then. Yeah. Uh, going to the chat room, Lori going back to the uh, Ace Frehley uh, vibrator story goes, how many batteries did it hold and did he use Vegemite as lube? <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, I have to keep listening. I, we, it was time to talk to you when the vibrator subject came up. So maybe she talks about the lube in there. It's no, she does not. Thing. She does not. I was like the whole thing. All right, let's go. Let's go. Chapter one. Um, don't drop out of school. And the beginning of this, <laughs> the beginning of this, you were talking about how you wanted to fuck David Lee Roth. And uh, okay. I know you've got a ton of David Lee Roth stories when we did the Van Halen Drunk and Summer. You dove into it a little bit. Do you know uh, talk a little bit about this chapter and then uh, let's get into Dave's stories. Well, that, okay, basically my book starts out chapter one because every, every chapter is a don't. And yeah. that yeah. came about because when I wanted to write a book, I was wondering, well, what's, what's it about? What's my theme? What's, uh, so I started just jotting down everything that I've ever done. And then I had to laugh at myself because I've, I've done everything that nice girls aren't supposed to do. So um, chapter one, the first sentence, um, I wonder what I have, could have achieved ac academically had I been as ambitious um, academically as I was in fucking David Lee Roth. So yeah, I, and I was 14. See, Back then, or was I 15? I don't know. It was 1984. It didn't matter. I didn't fucking move back then. I'm right, not right, sure right. I ever have, to be honest. I thought I did. <laughs> you find out that later on in the book, but I'm not really sure. But that's, that's, that comes later in the book. But yes, okay. my, Don't Drop Out of School is chapter one. And that does start with my crush on David Lee Roth and 
1984, going to the Worcester Centrum, and something happened to me the first time I saw him come out on stage, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that he had that effect on. But men and women, I was like, wow, you know, his mile high splits in the air and mm -hmm. the spandex pants and like just that energy. And it was just, you just wanted to be part of the party, you know? Right. It was like it was, it was, who wants to be in school? Like you want to join the party. It was, yeah, I, yeah it sums up the eighties basically. Right. Um, you ended up in Memphis. Um, and I know you didn't, the, your journey to Memphis is in the book. Yes, that's and, the same chapter. Um, okay. My mother, uh, I, it, I tell all you'll, you'll relate because it sounds like you grew up similarly to me. I was kind of a latchkey kid and um, she was never home. So we, had, we threw parties. And then when the police caught us, we brought it out to the fields and on yep. out to the ice, you know, and we built bonfires and we blasted Led Zeppelin and Tom Petty and, you know, Leonard Skinner, and, you know, like that. We collected the empty bottles so we could have the money to buy concert tickets. You know, that was, that was the, those were the good old days. And then we went to concerts and we'd find the tallest guy we could find and say, Hey, can I sit on your shoulders? And that was the best seat in the house. Mm -hmm. Those were the days. And then eventually my mother kicked me out. Um, I, I'm still mad about it, but she kicked me out and I had to go to Memphis where my father was living. Now, if I'd okay. stayed in Massachusetts, probably would have never met Eric. Um, I lived in a very small town in the middle of nowhere. Concerts mm -hmm. were an hour away. Um, yeah, same here. Um, you know, and I, I, but when I moved to Memphis, I started going to John Robertar's modeling school, and I met all these rocker chicks, and then and there's a much bigger rocker scene, probably because it's a city, but my, there was a much bigger rocker scene in Memphis, like very live music scene. I mean, uh, I loved every minute of it, and so my friends were all these rockers, and I had these girlfriends who had it down, like they knew the band schedules, like what time the buses were rolling in, where they were staying. Like we, um, not that we were stalkers or, I don't know, I wouldn't really even consider us groupies, but I got involved with like this fun set of girls mm -hmm. who that's what they did. They hung out with bands when they came through town and the rest, you know, well, it's history. That's right. Did, did you have the strong Massachusetts accent? Uh, I don't think I ever did. Did you, my, well, well, okay, did you pick up the Southern accent when you were in Memphis? Yeah, I did, I did. And then when I drank, like sometimes I drink and it still comes out, the Southern accent. Um, but I never had the intense Massachusetts accent, I think because I lived in central Massachusetts. Okay, okay. Besides that, my mother would send me to San Diego for summers. So I spent every other summer in San Diego. Um, and that's, hence, I got this fantasy about living in California. I always right. wanted to live in California. Mm -hmm. So, um, how, let me ask you this before we go on. How are you with California now? Are you um, are you kind of like uh, one foot in, one foot out, like a lot yeah, of us uh, are? Or are you yeah, uh, I'm actually thinking about going back. I'm spending more and more time these days back in Massachusetts. Um, small town life appeals to me again. Um, after the whole COVID thing, I there's really nothing to do in LA anymore. Like everything that was fun here is... Actually, even before COVID, I think, you know, just didn't go out as much for many years. Life goes on, you know, change. And um, I, I, especially with the acting industry, that's pretty much the last reason for me to be here. And things mm -hmm. aren't, they might change, but the, the, nothing's going on. Right. So I am I miss my East Coast people and I'm thinking of a permanent move. But for now, yeah, I'm spending a lot of time back. There. Did you get sick of the Elvis shit in Memphis? No, I love it. Yeah. I'm a huge Elvis fan. Fuck yeah. Did you I like have, Memphis? Because I, I if I had been around earlier, I would have been one of those girls. I would have been hanging outside of Graceland's gates, like Elvis, look at me, look at me screaming. Did yeah. you ever? Uh, did I you ever sign the wall? Times. Hmm? Did you ever sign the wall? No, I did not sign the wall. I did. I, I did. I yeah, did. I've been there at least at least five times. Um, I know I took. Eric to Sun Studios. I can't remember if we went to Graceland together. Sorry, I just go back to Eric on everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we're, we are going to get to Eric because, I mean, that's a, such a huge part of your story. Um, let's move on to the second chapter, which is don't have a one-night stand. And I'll read you, uh, read everybody. I'll just read everybody the first paragraph, which is kind of, I think it's a good way to get into these because if, you, if you've ever read The Dirt and that's anybody listening, the first paragraph of that book just captures you. And it's Vince saying, 
Tommy used to fuck this girl that we called Bullwinkle because she had a face like a horse. The only reason he stayed with her is when he is because when she came, she shot across the room. You, you, that that fucking that that hooks you into the book, <laughs> right there. Yeah, mine's not quite. That. No, it is not. I'm not comparing yours to that at all. But I'm just saying that I was always the first paragraph is good. So this is chapter number two. Don't have a one night stand. November seventeenth, nineteen eighty seven. It began in the lobby bar of the Peabody Hotel. Here, let me get. Where's my gimmick? Oh, this makes it easier. I can't read with a shit because my eyes are shot. The South's Grand Hotel in downtown Mem Memphis. It's famous for the Parade of Ducks. That is absolutely true. Everybody knows that has been to Memphis knows that. They waddle to and from the lobby fountain at 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. every day. My friend Mary and I weren't there to see the Ducks. We were there to see the Rolling Stones guitarist, Ron Wood, and an exhibition of his art. Where are we going in chapter number two? This is, this is obviously the chapter where you meet, meet Eric. That's when I meet Eric. That, I met him right there in that lobby bar of the Peabody. So he was there to see the exhibit or were they staying there? Well, they were staying there and um, I didn't know it at the time because I had been to the Kiss concert a mm -hmm. couple nights before. So I thought they had left town. Right. Um, so we were back a few nights later for the Ron Woods exhibit. And we were sitting here and there was three guys over here and the, from the back of his head, it looked like it was Paul Stanley. They had similar hair. Right. And so we thought, that's weird, because we just saw Kiss play, and it looked, but it looks like Paul. And then when he turned, I saw that it was Eric Carr, and I overheard him talking to the other guys about getting a cab, and they were going to go to this bar called Midway Cafe to see the Willies play. And I just chimed in, and I said, I have a car. I'll take you. And they said, OK. And that's how we met. Wow. Yeah. Just boom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's in Kiss. I'll, I'll give you a ride. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, it's funny I, because I had posted them. I was. I knew who Eric Carter was. I mean. Yeah. I, and he had given backstage passes to my friend Mary two nights later and walked right past me in the hallway. So, but didn't notice me. And now two nights later, like everything happened. Right. So, um, and so eighty-seven. That would have been. God, that would have asylum. Is it the asylum tour? Was it Crazy Nights? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. 87, because Smashes was 88. And then 89, 90 would have, 90 would have been uh, Hot in the Shade. Yeah. So I just have to get my... Yes, you're right. Kiss Ducks in a, uh, in a line here. Huh. See, Ducks, I went back to the Peabody Hotel with the Ducks. <laughs> See what I did right ducks there? Ducks in a row, not Ducks in ducks a row. Whatever. Ducks in a row, Ducks in a row. Ah, it's the same gimmick. Uh, what were your first impressions of meeting Eric? Uh, he was just really sweet. You know, he, he didn't seem like rock star. He was very soft-spoken. Mm -hmm. He's funny. Um, he was always cracking jokes and, uh, he'd shift between being really, really funny and then kind of gazing at me and felt like we were all alone one moment. And then another moment we were part of you know, the joke laughing with everyone, but, you know, just had this connection. Of course you did. I mean, it, it lasted how long? Oh, till he died. So, yeah, obviously until yeah. he died. Yeah. Until he died. Uh, let's go. Uh, all right. Chapter three. Don't off. Don't run off with a rock star. You obviously ran yeah, off with Eric. Chapter about Eric. Yeah. The, the, uh, and he was originally one chapter of my book, but he now he's in every chapter except one. But he, I, that chapter got too long. The chapter of our relationship got way too long. So I had to mm -hmm. split it into two. So thus, don't run off with the rock star happens when I moved away from Memphis and moved to LA. Where, and Eric lived in New York City. So oh, okay. yeah, he lived in Manhattan, but he was going to be recording Hot in the Shade uh, in LA. And I had gone to LA. Um, since I met him, I went on vacation with my girlfriends from Massachusetts. Um, we all met. Uh, over New Year's Eve in LA and oh my god the Sunset Strip and all the guys in spandex pants and all that whole world like I was just mesmerized by the whole thing and so when I got back to Memphis I was a journalism major at Memphis State oh I wow not, kick ass yeah I could not focus anymore on school I just daydreamed about the Sunset Strip all day long so I told Eric he was on tour in Europe but we kept in touch my phone and I told him that I was thinking about re relocating to LA and 
he wasn't happy about it. Mm-hmm. And he warned me what happens to nice girls like me. To right. not, what when they get corrupted by LA and he didn't want that to happen to me. Mm-hmm. And then he also mentioned that he was gonna be in LA uh, to do Hot in the Shade, to, to be recording. And so I didn't say anything, but a little light bulb went off and I was like, uh, okay, well then I'm definitely moving there then. Well, of course, so, what's it like? Close. Uh, Carrie, let me ask you this. What's it like? I mean, cause obviously I know what it's like being, uh, being a fanboy. You know, just being one of these rubes that goes down to the rainbow and hangs out at the rainbow. What's it like being, and I'm, yeah, I'm on the fringe of a circle, but it doesn't fucking matter because it doesn't even matter anymore. But, you know, in that day and age, what's it like being on the arm of somebody who's in fucking Kiss and then, you know, getting to experience the strip and the rainbow and places like that on that level? Oh, you're making me cry. I cry in every fucking interview. It wouldn't be me if I didn't. It was great. It's, you know, it's, it, I wish I could put it in a capsule. Mm-hmm. I wish I could put that feeling in a capsule. Um, it was like this feeling that you're invincible. Nothing bad happens to anyone. At that point in my life, I didn't know of failure. I didn't know mm-hmm. of heartbreak. I didn't know of the cruel things that life can do to you. I just, everything was rosy and I was going to be a movie star and I was with a rock star and why my grandparents said, you better find something to fall back on, go to secretary school. And I'm like, why, why would I do that? Like I was so positive. So there was no reason not to be, Mm -hmm. you know, I had every, everything happened the way that I envisioned it in high school. I was going to grow up and marry a, a rock star. And I was going to be famous and everything. I was still a teenager at this point. I was still yeah. a teenager while it was falling into place exactly as I imagined it. So yeah, that's why I tear up because um, that feeling I'll never get back once, once I lost him and I found out that dreams don't all come true at, at all. Exactly the opposite. Like when you ask me that question of what it feels like to be um, a part of that, like it's, yeah, I felt like um, almost like robbed of my, like that's a feeling I'll never have again. No matter who right. I'm with, I don't care. The next guy I'm with is, I don't know, name somebody. No matter who it is, I'll never feel that, that feeling again. Okay. Yeah. Was it tough for you? Because I, I, I know you, you're not a, a drug person. I know Eric obviously wasn't either, no matter what Paul Stanley may or may not have said in his book. <laughs> that's one thing say. I agreed with. Uh, I keep calling her the wrong name, Rachel, basically. Rachel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had, Paul is a liar. And um, that's one of the biggest lies I've ever heard him say, which was unnecessary. What is the point of trying to make Eric sound like he was on drugs? To, to try to make you sound like a less of an asshole for the way you treated him when he was sick and dying? Right. Um, that, that they to try to put him down to cover up now your own bad behavior? I would have more respect for him if he just came forward and said, you know, Perhaps we handled it wrong. Perhaps we, perhaps, you know, it was a hard time for everyone. Like I, I try to take the high road and I say, Mm -hmm. you know what? I'd like to think we were all doing the best with the knowledge we had at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I try to say that. I try to have some class. Paul doesn't try to have any, I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's basic, I guess, you know, I agree with Rachel on certain things. I guess when you're so famous and rich like that and you're told you, you, you know, you can get away with anything. I guess you for you forget that you can't, especially right. in the age of social media, where where you might he he's was famous. He's like an old dinosaur. He was famous back in the day when people like me or Rachel or other people didn't have a voice because there wasn't the internet and podcasts and um, people like me couldn't have self published. I would have had to have a big publishing deal. Well, you know what? Times have changed. Everyone has a voice. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, let, let, look, let's just dive into this. Uh, but before we do that, first half of the show brought to you by Beater Amplification. That's two E's, beateramplification.com. You see that beautiful beater head right behind me. Oh, my God. Hand-wired, hand-built, 100 watts of testicular fortitude, three channels, old-school kiss tone, old-school metallic tone, and that old-school clean-ass fender tone all in one amazing amplifier. And these guys are starting to do – uh, they're starting to do rack mounts now. Check them out. Two E's, beateramplification.com. And also hit up 
please hit up their Facebook and give them a like. And also my good friends over at Mackey, if you're looking to get into podcasting, you're looking to get into home recording, check out Mackey.com. That's M-A-C-K-I-E. Check out the studio bundles. Very affordable way to get into recording, podcasting, and the whole nine yards. Also hit them up on Facebook as well. That's Mackey.com. Um, all right. So uh, look, look, I, we're going to get into all the fun stories, you know, about when, when Eric was alive and all that stuff. But I, I've just got questions about surrounding his death. You, you always heard Gene and Paul talk about, um, like, like on the Kiss Extreme close-up video, they got, seemed to get very emotional about it. Uh, but I didn't stories, see that video, so maybe it looks uh, But, I mean, the stories are out there that they, obviously, they weren't at his funeral. Or yes, they, they were. were. They were. They were. Oh, it was the wake. Uh, Paul well, wasn't at the wake. You no, know, uh, that's not true. It was Gene okay. that was not. Gene, Gene was having liposuction, so he wasn't at the wake. Okay. Um, I call it elective surgery in my book. The truth is, uh, Bruce is a really nice guy. And mm -hmm. I told Bruce that I wrote that. And Bruce is like, Carrie, you know, why don't you tone it down? Call it su elective surgery or something. So I listened to Bruce and I did, hey, whatever. He had an appointment he couldn't cancel. Let's put it that way. That's right. the truth. You know what? He's Jewish anyway. I, maybe he doesn't believe in wakes. That's fine. He mm -hmm. did come to Eric's funeral. They were both at Eric's funeral. Eric, Gene was not awake. Paul was. Uh, Paul, I was sitting in the front row, and Paul, like, came down to me to give me his condolences, and I went, <gasps> faked a big sob and put my hand, my head on my lap so I wouldn't have to look at him. That's how how disgusted I was with him, the way he treated Eric. So, but they were at the funeral, and um, they expected it to be, you know, all about them. None, none of Eric's friends and family were thrilled to have them there. It's true. That's okay. like the only, the only said thing he says in his book that is true. But you know, it was upsetting to all of us who really loved and cared about him to see them stressing him out so much while the poor guy was fighting for his life. Right, so yeah, right. we, we weren't extremely happy to see them. And besides. This is, it wasn't like a fucking KISS concert. This was the drummer's funeral. We, yeah. we weren't all supposed to be like excited running up to Paul and Gene, we're happy you're here. No, everybody right. was extremely sad and solemn. And for fucking Paul, such a narcissist, to take it personally and fucking write about it in his book, like a fucking crybaby. Oh, we were treated so badly at the funeral. You know what? Let Eric have his fucking funeral. Don't make it about you, okay? Right. This is not your moment. That was his, mm -hmm. not yours. I can't stand him. Um, well, it, I think, I mean, obviously everybody's heard the rumors. And if you haven't heard the rumors, if you're in the KISS world and you're listening to this, you obviously had heard the rumors about how they, they cut off. Uh, is this true or not that they cut off his health insurance while he was in the no. hospital? No, they threatened it, but they didn't do it. Okay, okay, so that is not true. No, he never lost his health insurance. Okay. Um, there, is, there was a guy working in the KISS offices named Jess Hilsom, who has since, uh, he's, he was Paul's psychiatrist. So Paul hired his personal psychiatrist to run the KISS office. Another weird story. Yeah, but it's totally true. Ask anyone in the KISS circle. Everybody knows that this guy, Jess, was Paul's psychiatrist who's now running the business. <laughs> and so since, so he's the one that would do the dirty work and he would call the hospital and he would threaten to take Eric's insurance away. Now, of course, we assumed Gene and Paul had to approve these things, you know, right. to, but there was legal papers drawn up. I saw them. Eric refused to sign them. It was like, basically, he, he was saying, I'm not dead yet. You know, I, you can't, you can't, he wasn't, he wasn't going to, and I agree with him. Like they wanted him to say he quit so they wouldn't look like assholes for firing a sick guy. Um, right. and, he, and he refused to do it. He never did do it. Um, Paul pressured him a lot. I overheard a lot of pay phone calls. Paul would call the house uh, at night. Eric was sleeping, sleeping off chemo. Paul would call, I'd answer the phone. Is Eric there? I got impatient. Um, yeah, he pressured him and I was angry about that because I wanted everyone to be as positive as I was and I wanted right. Eric to get well. And it seemed like um, Paul was using it as his opportunity to get rid of him because he already had issues with him and he and wanted him out he had I, I, paul had actually uh, the sympathy of a fucking ice cube for eric 
he had this sympathy and uh, empathy. He, I don't think he knows empathy. I think he, he doesn't understand uh, the emotion. Empathy. Mm -hmm. um, just my personal interpretation. I'm sorry if I'm getting off of your question. No, 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 no. It's all good. It's go oh, Carrie, let me ask you this. Uh, the trunk, Eddie Trunk is always, because Eddie Trunk was close with, uh, with Eric. Um, and he always said that, Eric always said to him that he was afraid that he, he was, his, his role in the band was in trouble. Like he always no, felt like he was going to get. No, no. I mean, actually, Eric, Eddie knew Eric longer than I did. I mean, I don't know their personal conversations before I came along. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when that started, but it certainly was. Yeah, it was a huge issue when uh, Eric got sick, as soon as he got sick, because, you know, Eric Singer was in Paul Stanley's solo band. Correct. So, so Eric knew, Eric Carr knew that Eric Singer was being groomed. And two years ago, I went to, I did the Kiss Expo, and Eric Singer sat down next to me. It was his 60th birthday party, and he sat down and he said, hey, Carrie, you know, so-and-so told me that Eric used to be afraid, like, I was going to take his place in the band that he used to. I said, yeah, it's true. Absolutely. He was, in, he was always in a fret about it because, um, well, they're trying to kick him out. So obviously it would make natural sense to say, oh, the guy that cho Paul chooses for his solo band, he likes playing with that guy. I mean, yeah. it's only common fucking sense. You know, of course he yeah. wanted Eric Singer in the band. And I don't hold this against Eric Singer because, hey, someone had to be the drummer, you know? Yeah, exactly. Eric, Eric exactly. Died. It's not... So I have nothing but love for Eric Singer. It's not, I hold nothing against him. I want everyone to know that. If it wasn't him, it would be someone. Right. And Eric Carr didn't have anything against Eric Singer either. It was just what, what was going on was plain right. as day. Right. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it makes complete sense, especially because, I mean, uh, we all know, as Kiss Geek said in the 80s, and, you know, even today, Paul runs that fucking band. You know, it, it's, it's basically Paul's band. Well, I think Gene is brilliant. Um, I don't think he could have done it without Gene. Oh, I think no, absolutely. The of, the two of them, uh, you know, I, hey, they stay together. Most, uh, most marriages don't last as long. So right. congratulations to them. You know, they found right. a way to make it work. And, and, right. and they, it works well for them, whatever they're mm -hmm. doing. You don't get where they are by not stepping on a few people on your way there. So right. absolutely, yes, they did. Um, here, let's do this. We're going to take a short break, uh, two minutes and two seconds. Uh, if you need to refill your beverage, uh, if you have to go throw a whiz, whatever you got to do, we'll be right back. <laughs> Girls don't throw whizzes, Izzy. Sure you do. I don't okay, throw a whiz. I've never said such a thing. Okay, you spray I, a whiz. I can't imagine those words coming. <laughs> Damn, I'm, I'm from Minnesota. We're South Canada. We say shit like that. I got a whiz, eh? I'm a country girl. I don't say throw whiz. I still say like I'm gonna use the restroom. Yeah, see, you're but you're a lady. Go pee. You're a lady. Uh, I'm a break? I'm a degenerate redneck. Oh, when you read my book, you'll find out I used to be one. I I learned over time to be a lady. I was called Rocky in high school because I used to like just punch out anyone that fucked with me. That is uh, awesome. So Let's get into redneck stories when we get back. Let's talk about fun shit when you get back. Okay. Well, when we get back. All right, back. Two oh. minutes, two seconds. It's another fucking podcast. Carrie Stevens. Oh, my good friend. Actress, playmate, uh, author, and of entrepreneur. course. Entrepreneur. StayYoungAndSkinny.com. Entrepreneur. That's you right. We're going to talk about Dave's podcast. influence on that. We'll be right back. Rockwood Saloon Authentic Apparel takes rock and roll fashion to a new level. With their tees and tanks for men and women. They also make custom shirts, jackets, vests, pants, hoodies, beanies, and more. The Rockwood Graphics Department can design anything from your logo. T-shirt design, promo posters, band swag, and printed at great prices. From tour shirts and custom stage gear to killer threads from the street to the stage, Rockwood Saloon has it all. Rockwood Saloon, authentic rock and roll apparel for stage and street. World Tour tested for quality, comfort, style, and durability. Check them out at www.rockwoodsaloon.com. That's rockwoodsaloon.com.
If you need to promote your band or business or just want to stylize, personalize, or customize your ride, check out vid-decals.com. Want to create and customize your own stickers representing your band or make your own bumper sticker? Vid Decals can do it. All stickers are printed on quality vinyl and can be placed on any flat surface. Stickers are an affordable way to promote your band or business. Go to vid-decals.com to get started. That's vid-decals.com. Vid-decals.com. Retro Arcade brings Minnesota and surrounding areas arcade games from the days gone by. All of those great games from pizza joints and arcades are available in cocktail units and custom machines. Dozens of favorites from your youth in one machine to complete your game room or man cave. Retro Arcade also sells and services your favorite pinball machines. Find them at Facebook.com slash 80 Arcade. That's Facebook.com slash 80 Arcade. Retro Arcade. Your youth is just one click away hey what's going on this is tom arnold i like uh, fat women and cocaine and you're listening to izzy presley here on another uh, fucking podcast and uh, i know izzy uh from cocaine anonymous meetings i've actually uh seen him at the meetings with uh, uh ace von johnson from uh fat- i probably shouldn't say this out loud but ace has got a bad coke problem and uh his sponsor is uh is uh, Josh Todd from, and again, I shouldn't say this out loud, but Josh is a sponsor for Buck Cherry. He's addicted to upskirt porn. And uh, and they're both being sponsored by the Eagles, the, uh, the whole band, the Eagles. There's, anyways, uh, another fucking podcast right here with Izzy Presley. And uh, call your sponsor. Fucking A. Second half of the show brought to you by AMP Laser. Check them out, everybody. APLaser.com. You got something special coming up. Christmas is a hundred days away. You want to get something special and laser engraved? Hit up aplasers.com, and they also are the ones doing the roadie packs. Yes, Lori, all the way in Australia, he does have one of the brand new roadie packs with the brand new logo on it. Uh, it is a tumbler. It is a uh, Zippo type lighter. It is a flask, and um, um dog tags yes there you go the dog tags uh if you want to order those hit me up directly and you can also add one of those great shirts to it yes the uh the the fucking uh the gimmicks you know the old school jersey t-shirts you gotta bear with me it's been a couple weeks i'm trying to get my flow back but hit them up aplaser.com and also our good friend john palumbo we love us some John Palumbo over another effing podcast. If you have a band, if you have a business, you need a logo done. You need a website done. Well, there's this guy. His name is John Palumbo. And we love John Palumbo. And when you talk to John Palumbo, you call him John Palumbo. You call him by his full name. Why? Because that's what Uli John Roth does. Hello, John Palumbo. I would like to talk to you, John Palumbo. How are you, John Palumbo? So now we always call him by his full name, John fucking Palumbo. But if you have a band, you have a business, you need a website done, you need a logo done, you hit up our good friend, John Palumbo. JohnPalumboDesign.com and John Palumbo Design on Facebook. That is right. Oh, my goodness. Such a great, great time talking to Carrie. She'll be back in two and two. She'll be right back. Uh, I think she had to go, uh, I'll use the restroom. I I think as the, as the ladies say, or as you know, us old fat long hairs like me say, throw a whiz, um, or even, oh, let's see. That's uh, Scotty checking in from Canada says hit the can. Um, and Lori also says the tumbler is awesome. And, uh, Lori says, take a leak. And, uh, Lori also says my ears are glued to this interview. This is a good one. Uh, he also says, good one, Izzy, make the hot chicks cry. Uh, I love being a fanboy. Lori is very, uh, very active in the chat room today. Scotty's very quiet. Maybe he's just so much engulfed in this interview that he can't uh, comment, or maybe it's the 1-1 hockey game in the third with uh, 18, almost 18 and a half minutes left in the third. That could be. And God bless, I can't believe I'd ever say this, even though I'm wearing the jersey right now the sweater. God bless the Dallas stars going to the cup. It's sacrilege being a Minnesota North stars fan, but uh, Hey man, it's like, 
it's like cheering on your ex-wife, cheering for the stars, being a Minnesota North Stars fan. Carrie is back. There I she is. I'm shooting a whiz. <laughs> shooting a whiz. Oh shit! I should probably unmute you. That would be good. Yeah, she just got done shooting a whiz. I said throwing a whiz. Um, oh, so I just got done throwing a whiz. Uh, Scotty says checking in from Canada. Says hit the can. And uh, Lori says, take a leak. But yeah, they say that everywhere. My dad always says, take a leak. Uh, it's like, it's taken me like all these years to train my dad to stop saying, take a leak. Like, no, take a leak, eh? Right in the bathroom. I don't know. Did You know, you know what? Um, I, I did want to ask you this. Uh, talking about the Weinstein stuff before, um, mm -hmm. when we got into that, uh, there's somebody that, I mean, obviously you know him, and you know I know him from being around, uh, Ron Jeremy. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you... What are your thoughts on, on Ron and uh, what, what, what's happening right now? I'm shocked by it. Uh, I would see Ron at the Playboy Mansion all the time and at the Rainbow all the time. Yeah. And, um, he always seemed like he was on many substances. I don't know exactly what he was on, but he's, first I just thought he was weird. And then as time went on, I figured he was on heroin or something. But I mean, ugh, at the mansion, like, I, I would always just feel like this hand like suddenly on me and I'd turn around and it was like Ron Jerry Mace Herons on me. So, you know, a little creepy, but I never thought he would be dangerous. Um, and then the last time I saw him was just not this Christmas, but the, when was past Christmas? I'd lost track of time. Um, but I, I went, I, I took my son to the rainbow Christmas Eve and Ron Jeremy was sitting outside and, He's like, oh my God, Ron, it's Rod Jeremy. And I'm like, um, excuse me, like, how do you know? Who Ron <laughs> uh, yeah, he's 18. I'm like, how do you know who Ron Jeremy is? And he said, Mom, everyone knows Ron Jeremy. And I, when I prodded him more, I guess he has ads for, I don't know what, some lube or sex stuff. Like on all the porn sites, I guess he has yeah. ads for businesses. So I guess that's how my son knows who he is. And he's like, oh, I almost want to take a photo to like send my friends just for fun he's like but my son's shy so he's like no let's, let's not do it and I go I know him I'll just ask him for you and he's like no mom don't I'm like come on you know because he was sitting right at the entrance to the rainbow right you know where the valet is like on a stool yep. he yep. looked like he was on heroin to be honest he was like falling over and I said excuse me I said remember me Carrie I'm a playmate you know me from the mansion I said can my son get a picture of you with you and he said oh like he could barely speak enough to, I could tell he, he, he said yes to the photo, but it completely ignored him there with my son. It was kept trying to convince me to go to the bathroom with him. Let's go just go back to the bathroom together. And I managed to evade him. It wasn't that hard because he was so fucked up, but he did ask me to go to the bathroom with him. Now, I am looking, trying to be fair about these rape accusations going, okay, have I gone to the bathroom with him? I would have put myself in a bad position. Mm -hmm. Would he have raped me? Um, do I think he's capable of rape? I don't know. He never seemed particularly violent. Um, he did seem on drugs. Maybe he was going to offer me drugs in the bathroom. They'd go hand in hand. Maybe he would expect favors for it. I don't know because I never did that with him. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you live, um, he definitely lived on the edge and yeah. things can spill over especially in this day and age of the Me Too stuff, you don't know what's rape and what's not rape anymore. Right. I mean, like I said, I accidentally accused Oliver Stone of sexual assault. I had no idea that grabbing someone's boob was sexual assault. When I tweeted that, honestly, I didn't mean to get into the Me Too movement. Yeah. I was just stating something like, like that just happened to me. I didn't even know it was sexual assault because my whole life people have been grabbing my boobs and grabbing my ass and grab, gra like where I grew up, that's, it used to be a compliment to get your ass grabbed in the mall. In the oh, yeah. Yeah, didn't you, you know, it wasn't a, a crime. And I didn't, I honestly, I, I didn't, I honestly didn't mean to get into the middle of that whole thing. So, right, right. you know, and I'm very lucky. I have very few stories um, to tell about bad things that happened to me. Um, Playboy uh, really protects you when, when you're a playmate. Um, uh, the cut the company really protected me and, and before that I think I had such a I had such an innocence about me that really worked for me I I didn't I really didn't get a lot of and, and if they if they if I was getting a casting couch proposal I think I was too naive to even understand that that's what it was 
Right. You know? Right. So, um, um, you know, bad things, I, I'm very lucky. I didn't have a lot of bad things happen to me. There were some close calls, but I'll tell you what, there was just as many working in, or more, working in the food and beverage industry mm -hmm. as a waitress and a hostess as there was in the entertainment industry. Right, so right. I don't think it's fair to say it's just the entertainment industry. It's, it's, it's in all industries. Well, see, I always, I mean, I bartended for six and a half years and I always, I always equate, it's almost like, you know, saying that all males should go to the military for two years. I think everybody should work behind the bar for at least a year. Yeah. Because working behind a bar toughens you up <laughs> to the real world because the ass grabbing that goes on behind a bar back and forth and the shenanigans and, and, and just. That's why I, I experienced more of it being um, in, in that industry. And yeah. And, and attempted rapes and everything else. And oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Movie, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the, in the movie industry, you know what? When I was working on a movie mm -hmm. on a set, wearing a little mini skirt or something, you know, the guys in the crew are hooting and hollering. On Playboy sets, I'm completely naked, like rowboating naked. Yeah, naked, yeah, yeah. Riding horses naked, and they don't fucking blink. When you're in the studios, you walk. You just get used to being naked. You walk around naked all the time. Right, right, right. Blink. I never had any sort of harassment or problem at all being completely naked um yet in the real world uh clothed i i did <laughs> interesting yeah right well i mean i i guess what i was getting at and i'm not talking like attempted rape type stuff i'm just talking you know playful ass grabbing ass slapping but yeah i think the days of just shit over. like that oh yeah no i i agree yeah, but it's, it's, i think i think those days toughen people up i was, I was used you know? to that too i just that that's just what happened to me i didn't think like right, i said I didn't right. think it was against the law it was annoying but it wasn't against right right you no know, if, if i didn't really understand i was accusing someone of a big crime and i almost felt bad about that afterwards when it was all over the press because i was like yeah yeah <laughs> Like I didn't mean to try to ruin his career or anything. Right, he just right. My boob at a party, like I don't know, um, thirty years ago, I didn't. I don't think that should come back and ruin his career. If oh, I really, absolutely, like, absolutely. If, if I if I say that, like uh, virtually nobody would print it because they want to hear all the dirt. They don't want anything. Right, right. Like, Oops, right. I actually didn't mean to. I mean, yeah, he's. I'm sure he's obnoxious with like i don't want to take his career down right you know right, like right. my intent was not that yeah so i kind of felt bad i, I guess where i was going <laughs> because like working behind the bar with people it's kind of like you know you're a team locker room type shit so it's like it it's just friendly bullshit that's all it is people you don't know that's a different story you know what i mean right that makes sense yeah, well, yeah, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you just slap your friend's ass, and they slap it back. It's just, it's just goofy bullshit. And I'm not saying on the other side of crossing a line, yada, 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 because that's it, horrible. It, it, it's, it, it, now it's very confusing because no one yeah. knows where the line, where you draw the line. Right. Like, you know, a very good friend of mine, after me too, he's a big producer, and I was talking to him about it, and he said, well, Carrie, you know, we can't risk hiring somebody if you're going to sue somebody just because they brushed against you. And I'm like, right. But I didn't sue anyone, but my name is all over the press now as if I did, as if I was a part of this big movement. And I actually didn't, I didn't sue anyone. I tweeted, I tweeted that he grabbed my boo at a party 30 years ago. I had no idea it would be such a mm -hmm. thing. And that's kind of the reason I started to write a book. Cause I started to go, God, they think that was important. That was like most insignificant two seconds of my life. And that goes viral. So, you know, right. then maybe the rest of the stories would uh, be of interest as well. I think they're much more interesting than those. Oh, no. I, I mean, I, I think you've definitely got a second book in you. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm uh, sure this, that I, I can just imagine. My this book. I don't know if I could write another one. This is the book. Yeah. And you, look, and this is the great thing that we, and we haven't talked about this yet. You did this all on your own. You yeah. didn't, you didn't, you, you turned down a bunch of publishers. Well, no, I had a big agent and okay. um, I had a big agent and the biggest agent and best agent I could have possibly dreamt of getting. So I thought it was a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kept getting blown off and put up and blown up for no reason why. And I'd say, what publishers have you submitted it to? My emails weren't getting returned. Um, 
I started hearing about gaslighting. As you know, there's several names in my book that wouldn't want my book to come out. Right. And they didn't, they probably didn't know um, what was going to be said. Mm -hmm. I could have been like this Rachel uh, person. I actually, actually, there's very much worse things. I think people have asked if I've had any response from the people I wrote about. I said, no, because they all know damn well I could have wrote worse things than I did. Right. They should be sending me thank you letters. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, it's my memoir. I didn't write it with the purpose of, of taking anyone down. It's like if you happen right. to be come along in my story and you were interesting, you're in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I had a conscious about it, which is why I asked what Rachel's purpose is, is because everything behind what I said, I weighed it. I'm like, okay, how much uh, of this do I need? Is it um, salacious? Is it malicious? Or does it make my story more interesting? Or do, does it just hurt someone needlessly? So I had to weigh everything. I had, I, I, I did it with purpose, not on impulse, which I think mm -hmm. is the difference. Um, yeah. And, and I carefully did it. It took me two and a half years to write this book. And I'm extremely happy. I just recently contacted the big agent that I had. Uh, I did not tell him that I was concerned that perhaps he blew me off, maybe because you play golf with uh, someone I wrote about. But uh, I, I, I'll never know that either. But all I do know is that um, I'm resourceful. I'm intelligent, and no matter what anybody said to me, my common sense, I've got street smarts. Um, it made common sense to me, if 80% of the world's books are sold on Amazon, mm -hmm. and, and we're in a pandemic, so people can't really go in stores, what the fuck do you need an agent and a publisher for? And right, if you're right. buying everything online, the re the, if I did that, I would be giving away 80 to 90% of my money um, and then taxes come along. So you might as well go, okay, I just did this, all of this for zero, nothing. Right. So um, I did it the smart way and I'm extremely proud of myself. I, you'd never know that cover was shot the third week of the pandemic <laughs> in my living room. Yes, I called Playboy's people, people I've worked with before. And I said, I need you to come to my house and make it look like I'm on the cover of a Playboy magazine. And I bought that bodysuit on Amazon for 30 bucks. We, nice. They brought their lighting. They bought a backdrop. And the photographer's assistant just said, just put your hand right here. And I did this and that was it. That, that was the perfect cover. And I, I'm, I, if, I had lo if I had given up creative control, had I had a publisher, I would not have a cover that good. Right. And when you, I don't know if you've had a chance to really look at my interior, but every bit of memorabilia and every photo that I included, it tells the story. Like you, yeah. you you really feel like you are me. You're living my life with Absolutely. me. You're following me around. You're feeling my emotions. And yeah, here's a here's an example of it right here. Yeah. You know, no, that's great. And uh, Carrie, I hate to break this to you, but uh, over my travels over the past two weeks, California is the only place you can't go into stores. I understand that because I have. <laughs> I know. I just, I just wanted to get that point across. Yeah. Else. Well, California is the only place. This, this was in the be, go to the mall. This was in the beginning of the pandemic when. Oh, I know. I know. I know. The world was shut down. Oh, was, yeah, I'm talking. I did that the third week of the pandemic. I shot that cover, and I started to. It was the, the first week of, and my friends in Ireland were locked down two weeks before we were. So uh -huh. I was getting my information from them and it seemed like everything that happened to us was happening two weeks later. Um, I know California is extremely late to open up, um, but in any case, whether you can go in a store or not, 80% of the world's books are sold on Amazon. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? If you don't want to do any of the work yourself and you're that big of a star that you can get a publishing deal, more power to you. Right. Um, but I think there's more and more people understanding that if they are willing to do the work to do it themselves, um, you definitely. Well, it makes um, it more. It makes it more worthwhile that way too, because you know you're. I've doing heard so many stories. You know, I heard that Lita Ford was so pissed when her book comes out came out. I heard that she was really pissed off when her book came came out because she read her own book and there there were so many um, mistakes and myths, truths that it wasn't really her life story. And I had heard things like that, and I went, you know what? I get one chance to tell my life story and I want to be hands-on. Like it has to be right. hand-picked everything that I say, every picture, every piece of memorabilia at placed exactly where I want it to be. Um, so I'm really proud. It was the hardest thing I've ever done 
mm-hmm. professionally. And I definitely the most work I've ever put into anything. It was the my blood, sweat, and tears in that. I'm extremely proud of it. And and, and it shows because, and that's why I'm so excited to dive into it. And I, I feel terrible I haven't had a chance, even though I just got it yesterday. But I was, it, but this came the look. This came together so quickly when I got back that you know it, it is what it is. But I, I'm very excited to read it because um, I've heard nothing but amazing things about it. And from what you're telling me, it's it's just going to be awesome. But let's dive into David Lee Roth. I mean, the book opens up with you saying how much you wanted to fuck David Lee Roth as a kid, or I wish I... Okay, so shoot me. I'm like... Oh, oh I no, know. I'm not. I'm not ripping on you. It's like, dude, look at all the people. He's the fuck. He is like the quintessential yeah, front star. He's yeah. the, he is the ultimate front man. He is the ultimate party He's fucker. still my fantasy. Like, I still feel like I think of him, even though... As you'll read in my book, I have recent encounters with him. I, I, he'll always be that. He'll always be 28 to me. Like he, he's still look. He's he's still he's still that same guy that came flying out on the stage, you know, and yeah. doing the splits. And I was like, forever changed. So, yeah, he's just like he's a really. Have you met him in person? I have never met Dave. He's on my. I mean, he's in the top five of people I would love to meet or interview. And just me, just say hi, shake his hand, and yeah, you know. Dave. I I used to hang out with him back in the day at Bordello and Bar One, and every guy that came up to say hi to him, he was nice to everyone. And then he'd go, "And this is Carrie. I love you, Carrie." Did he have the shade eating grin when he said it? Oh yeah, and this is Carrie. I love you, Carrie. Yeah, yeah. That's but cool. see, he was always so sweet. Like I never right. remember an asshole bone in his body. He was always very, very sweet. Um, how did you how how did you meet Dave? Well, I go into very a lot of detail in the story, but um, basically, I I worked really hard at trying to meet him for many years when I lived in Memphis, going to all of the Eat Him and Smile tour concerts and backstage passes, driving to Mississippi, Nashville, ever. He never came backstage. He was never back there, so I never met him. And then um, by the time I moved to LA, I was with my girlfriends at the beach one day. We'd stayed there late. You know, everybody used to, well, you got to LA late. But back in the, the good old days, we'd go down to Venice Beach, drink margaritas, hang out at the beach all day, sidewalk cafe. And then day turned into night and we were still kind of in our cutoff shorts and white tank tops and bathing suits. And we weren't gonna go in to Bordello because you know usually we dressed up to go in, but we decided to stop and say hi to the doorman, Keith. and. Then we decided uh, we'll just like go in for a minute, even though we're not dressed up for it. Right. And there was fucking David Lee Roth, like close enough to touch. So I'm like this. For the longest time, I can't even move. I'm. And then he turns and looks and turns and he looks and then he turns and he goes, hi. And I went, <gasps> yeah i was so starstruck so then i had this plan so i'm like okay he was there on a thursday next thursday i'm gonna go back and by the way eric was in on all of this okay so eric thought i don't know what he thought that i was ridiculous cute I, i don't know he was cool but i he knows like he knew about my crush on david lira so but he was in the studio recording and he Oh, it was cool. I wasn't jealous. So I went with him to the mall that the Beverly um, on Beverly, what's called the Beverly Center. So I wanted to find a special outfit to wear to go because if Dave was here there again, this time I wanted to look cute and meet him for real. So I got this little this polka dotted dress. It looked like one of those girls from the Cinderella video. Yep. You know the evil, not so ugly twins. Yeah. Yep. So I bought this little. It was white and black polka dots on top dress, black and white fluffy polka dots on the bottom. And I have a, like a little waist, so I was looking really cute. And um, I'm sure my hair was big, whatever, I don't remember that. But anyway, I had taken note that night of who he was with and who he was talking to. So I recognized somebody at Bordello that following Thursday when I was in the polka dot dress. Turned out to be Edmund, his uh, security guy, manager, mm-hmm. slash bodyguard. Um, Anyway, Ed, big, big Ed, Edmund. So 
um, I slyly started up a conversation with Big Ed. And next thing you know, David Lee Roth comes around the corner and it worked like a charm. I saw him just lean into Big Ed, clearly asking Big Ed who I was and to introduce me. And, and then Ed introduced us. And, and then we started this flirtation that lasted years and years. I don't even know. Like, it, 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 was, it was a fun thing. I would go out. He would always have a bunch of girls at his table. As soon as he saw me, he'd shoo them all his way, have, have his people get rid of them, have me right by his side all night. It was the I love you, Carrie thing all, uh, all over again. And then I, the ugly lights would come up and I would disappear. Like I turned into, Cinderella turned into a pumpkin at the end of the night. And I'd go home to Eric and I'd be like, guess what, guess what? Guess who was flirting with me tonight? David Lee Roth. And he was over it. He's like, go to bed, Carrie. You know? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because all those rumors about Paul, a lot of those rumors are the same about Dave, too. I know, but, well, I think I might have had sex with him, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm, sure, I'm not positive. I'm not positive. I thought I did for many years because I did finally go home with him. Um, it was my 23rd birthday. And now Eric had been gone for six months. And yeah. um, I, that's my chapter that's called Don't Drink Straight Whiskey. And it's funny okay. because this is a chapter that's, Eric's gone now. Uh, I, it's, a, it, it, it's an emotional chapter, like I'm trying to find myself spiritually. Mm -hmm. I always say this book is like almost famous meets eat, love, pray, because it's not a really a trashy tell all, but there's right. enough entertaining bits in there that it's, it's borderline, but then, you know, it's very emotional where my boyfriend dies and I wasn't raised with religion. I didn't yeah. know, I was told grow up and they were, my parents rebelled against the Catholic church and I was told to grow up and choose my own. But before you're 22 and your boyfriend is gone forever and you don't, you want to know where he is and how, like, how, how is he not here and I'm breathing and he's not. And where to get, like, I was just, mm -hmm. so the chapter is really mostly about my journey. It took me about four years to smile again. I mean, for real, mm -hmm. to smile again. It was the, it was the, the, I call them the lost years because I was really lost. But during these years, that fun, story happened about my going home with David Lee Roth night. Yeah. And when I was trying to find a title for the chapter that would work it, with the theme of the rest of the book, I needed a don't. I needed a don't for, to match all my other don'ts. Don't join uh -huh. a harem, don't post for Playboy, don't have an affair with a married man. They're all very racy. But I, I, that one, because obviously it was after Eric died and I was processing so much, but I, I found the humor in it. Don't mm -hmm. drink straight whiskey. Because the night that I went home with David Lee Roth, I was, oh, I was so nervous. I was so petrified. But I was like, I am not going to blow this opportunity again. Because right. I'd, bl I'd blown him off so many times. And this time I was like, okay, it's, I, I, I have no reason not to live every day like it's my last. And I need to do this. So yeah. I went to the bar, the bordello. I think I downed like 30 shots of whiskey. And I don't know. I, I remember some kind of blur about being in the back seat of a car with his bodyguard and then driving. And then I remember, next thing I know, I'm like, I wake up on someone's living room floor and I'm going, <laughs> where am I? I'm like, I'm on like a hot floor and the lights coming in the window. I have no, like, you know, when you wake up drunk and you're like, what? Like, I didn't know where I was for a second. Yeah, and all yeah, yeah. His arm like pumps around me and it's like, good morning with that big grin and he's kissing me and I'm like oh my god I'm with David Lira so I all these years I'd been assuming that we had sex did well, you wake I up naked with him. I yeah I was I was I, that's why I thought we had sex so I, I was naked um and he was naked and I remember body parts but um, <laughs> but however so I thought all these years I've been telling everyone I had sex with David Lee Roth I only well, shame on me for drinking too much whiskey I don't remember it and I was always like gosh I hope I wasn't like I hope I was as much fun that night as like you know I would have been had I I have no idea what happened and he drove me home he gave me a Ms. Olympia white t-shirt and I had like you know fishnet black stockings and cut off shorts you know like I remember exactly what I was wearing that night 
and he stopped at Coyote on Laurel Canyon and got us juice. Like I remember every moment like yesterday and I assumed we had sex. But then it was only, it's two years ago now, it's September two years ago, exactly two years, I went to a charity event that he was performing at, the Brett Shapiro charity event, and he recognized me in the audience. He summoned me backstage and I hope I'm not ruining my book for everybody, but yeah, he, he was so sweet when I hung out with him and I, uh, everything was going great. I'll, I'll let you read the book to hear the whole conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was very tender and sweet and everything was going great. And then he goes, but we never sealed the deal. And I'm like, no, sweetened the deal. He said, we never sweetened the deal. And I said, yes, we did. So here I am insisting that we did, and he doesn't remember, obviously. And then I'm going, and by the way, he's sitting there drinking Jack Daniels neat, and he's silent. You gotta read the whole book, it's very funny. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was, I made such an ass of myself. I talked like a blabbering fan, like which back in the day when I was in my 20s, I tried so hard to be cool, like I didn't know who he was, and I was just like, you know, uh, just hanging on his every word, but like didn't let on that I was a demented fan. So right. now, now, I'll cut to all these years later, and he wanted to reminisce with me because he remembered me, but I, I had forgotten that I used to hide that I was a fan and I acted cool around him. So now I'm like, blah, 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 blah. and then when I saw you in like 1993, and then you said, oh my, I, I, I made such an ass of myself. And <laughs> yeah, he's like, are you writing a book? And I, because I had been talking about it to his, manager and he said am I in it and I said as a matter of fact you're the first sentence and then I recited it I said I have to wonder what I could have achieved academically in life had I been as ambitious in school as I was in fucking David Lee Roth yes I said that right in front of his face and he was like mm -hmm. like I I honestly think I scared the man I think so, <laughs> I think he was like uh is she deranged and dangerous like I thought like he, I, I don't know if he, if he knew what to make of me, but he was very sweet, but quiet. And I've never known David Lee Roth to be quiet. So um, I'm gonna actually send him a copy of the book with a little note, like, see, read the whole thing, you'll find him. I'm not gonna stalk you or anything. But he said something very important to me uh, after I was done making a blathering idiot of myself. He said, uh, he walked away as he was saying good night. He said, he turned to me and he said, stay young and skinny. And I went, ooh. I'm like, that doesn't sound like he's gonna call me. So I guess that's, that sucks. But you know what? It stuck in my head. You know, like it stuck in my head for like weeks. I was like, stay young and skinny, Carrie. Stay young and skinny. I'd open the refrigerator. I'm like, oh, no, stay young and skinny. Look in the mirror. Oh, drink. Stay young and skinny. Like his words were like, in my head and then you know my dad's a scientist and i've been working on developing this anti-aging weight loss product with him and i did not like the name of my com my dad's company the name of the product anything and then boom i'm like walking down the hallway to go throw a whiz one day and all of a sudden i hear back. stay young and skinny that's perfect stay young and skinny so that's why my business is called stay young and skinny.com so i have a lot to thank dave for uh, i have a lot to thank him for um yeah so he said we we didn't have sex so i i don't know if either one of us really knows the truth i wanted to suggest a do-over um but if i did i might yeah and I, I definitely don't think he's gay um the bisexual thing you know what i've heard the rumors like everyone else i heard yeah. he was like living with his chef and they were boyfriend and girlfriend then i already had some japanese girlfriend that was 25 that he was in love with that, that. i mean He's very private about his life. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, See, um, I've, I've heard it's his hairdresser. Why does he need a hairdresser? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Hair. The book is called... He doesn't uh, have any hair anymore. Uh, the book is called Unrated, Revelations of a Rock and Roll Centerfold. <laughs> um, don't worry, we're not done yet. Um, let's talk about the movie Rockstar. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Well, you, you don't seem very excited about oh, that. That's just because when you find when you read the book, you'll find out that that's the movie that I thought was going to change my life. That was uh -huh. I, I was always told by my big agency managers that all you need is a 
small part in an A-list film to get discovered. So right. when I finally got a part in a big Warner Brothers picture with a $50 million budget, or was it 70 million, something like that, with Jennifer Aniston and Mark Wahlberg, I thought, this yeah. is it. This is it. I'm on my way. This is the yep. movie that's going to change my life. And it did change my life, just not in the way, not in the way that I thought it would. Well, you know? we'll leave that to the book because that sounds like a juicy story. Yeah. But uh, I mean, your experience, let's, let's talk about like the experience on set. I mean, does that ruin the story in the book? We talk about the experience on oh, set. Oh, I know. The set yeah. was fun. The set was fun. Everybody, I, again, times have changed. I, God, I feel bad for today's youth. I'm, I'm so grateful that I got to live in the time that I did. Right. We partied like crazy. I mean, not drugs, but we, right. Jennifer Aniston was making margaritas for all of us all day. Pictures of margaritas going on. Uh, Zach Wild was drunk from the time he got on set in the of morning. Course. We reeked of beer. He played my husband in the movie. I could be sober now, but I could, you know, barely stand the scent of him. Um, Levin, <laughs> yeah, Zach does not shower if anybody is well. Uh, well, you know, I love Zach. He's uh, was such a sweet, cool. Still love him. Um, I think he. I, I don't know. I'm not his wife. He. I, I don't know how much he showers. But back then, the beer you could smell the beer coming out of his skin. But, oh, okay. No, and then, um, gosh, I mean, everybody, we were all having fun, though. Like, there was no, yeah. nothing bad happened. There was no Me Too shit, like, no lawsuits. It was, it was yeah. kind of like we were making a movie about the rock scene in the 80s, and we were playing the part, even when we were, I was in the movie for, like, three minutes, but I was on set for 30 days, mostly mm -hmm. waiting around in the parking lot, drinking and shooting the shit and having fun. It mm -hmm. was great. <laughs> Tell me about Jennifer Aniston. I don't know a whole lot about her. <laughs> Your expression. Um, <laughs> she's super cute. I mean, she was she was shy. Like Brad Pitt was married to her at the time. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to like peek out my window of my trailer to try to get a glimpse at him when he would come to see her, uh, which wasn't Did that often. Meet him? A couple times. No, and um, and you know she was very sweet. Like she saw. Me, Rachel Hunter, Heidi Mark, the other rock star wives, because we did a lot of waiting around, waiting yeah. for the in scenes. And a lot we were on set, but not, you know, we had to be shown in the background part of the story, but got edited out. So we were there and working a lot more than you see in the movie. But, you know, she, she, was, she was very considerate of the fact that we were waiting around. And there was many a time, you know, she came up and said, oh, are you okay? You know, you know, just considerate of the fact that we were waiting and she was working where she knew what it's like to be an actor who just can't wait to get out there and do your thing. Right, so right. So I so found her very pleasant. Th there was no point at that she said, you know, you're probably going to meet this guy named Izzy in a few years. Um, <laughs> and no. uh, I, I would like no. to get, him know, get to know him at some point. So here's my info just in case. So th there was none of that. No, uh, I think that's unfortunate. She, now, now your reputation, your reputation precedes you. I'm sure I'll, I'm probably going to get an email from her later tonight and she's going to ask me to hook you up. Yes. I knew buying that championship belt was a good idea. <laughs> is she single again? I don't pay how was, uh, how was Rachel Hunter? She was okay. I used to be friends with her. We lost touch, but um because she was I mean, growing up in the time that i grew up you know we grew up in the yeah you know she was she more close shy and like she, she was, was one of the goddesses you know she was you know she would invite me to parties at her house I, like during shooting there was one sunday afternoon she had a like a brunch at her house and i thought it was so funny because rod stewart was there and i had like a fake um louis vuitton bag when i was getting my nails done you know they walk in and they try to sell you bags and I bought this beige for thirty dollars fake Louis Vuitton and yeah. I was I was standing at the counter um, where all the food was a party and my bag was on the counter next to me and Rod came up to me he's like you know they, you can buy these in Venice for like thirty bucks for the knockoff and I didn't know if he meant Venice Italy or Venice California but I don't think, <laughs> I don't think he knew I bought mine for thirty bucks at the nail salon that mine was actually a knockoff so I just kept my mouth shut. So um, funny. But she was, you know, she was cool. She was nice. I don't know what happened to her. We were friendly for a while. Like we used to text and, uh, but 
I had a baby, my life went on, like mm -hmm. you lose touch with people. Yeah. Not well, you know, ever, look, no, look, no, not look. because we ever had a falling out. We never did. I just honestly don't even know how to get in touch with her anymore. Uh, I don't even see her on social media. I guess I should look her up. Yeah, yeah, you know, you should, because you know, you got this pal named Izzy, you know. <laughs> Say it. <laughs> just of course, you know. She's married. Uh, you, you know my my middle name is Delusions of Grandeur, right? No. Oh, well, yeah, it is. It's a big middle name. It's a long middle name. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. Um, that should be the name of the show. Let me ask you this. Is there anybody in the book um, that's caught wind of it or read of it or read it? Um, yeah, that's had any problem that with what you've said? And no, nobody has. And I was very careful. Um, I was very careful. Unlike, we keep going back to Rachel's spicy little uh, podcast. Um, I didn't blurt things out. I was extremely careful about what I put into words, mm -hmm. um, conscious about my words. Uh, I told the absolute truth, but I wanted my story. Uh, like I, I, I almost w wish that girl had called me and written an intelligent book. She doesn't sound entirely stupid or crazy to me. I think she's extremely emotional. She You're talking about Rachel? She needs yeah. to be reeled in a bit. That's all. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, but no, no one's contacted me. Um, like I told you, everybody that's in that book that I wrote about knows damn well that I could have said a lot worse than I did. Right. And I have proof of all of it. <laughs> and um, I, my first drafts were um, more, mm, gave more detail to a lot of the stories like the Trump, Karen, Sex yeah, affair yeah. Sex affair. Well, uh, you know but what? Look, yeah, tell. The things about that is I, I, I went back through it and went, yeah, I, I, I have proof of things. I have old emails. I made sure yeah. I wasn't, the first time I made sure legally my ass was protected. Like I wasn't going to put anything, I wasn't going to do all this hard work so that's going to consume me and take all the money that I worked right, so hard. Right. That I was very careful with. But then with my final edit, it was less about legal and more about how, how, how does this uh, support your legacy? Mm. How, like, like, that's why I said I lost Rachel when it came to the vibrator thing. It's like, you know, I, you had some good points and, and, and then it's, and, and then when someone starts talking that way, you're like, now, now you just, you sound crazy. Um, mm. And, and it, it, it doesn't add anything to um, your legacy. Like, what are you, what are you giving back to the world? Who like who do you want to be? Know what do you want to be known for? Like if, if it's if you die tomorrow, like what do you want to be remembered for? I asked myself all of these questions before I put things down on paper. Um, so I I don't know. I, that's just me. I I, I gave it right. more thought. And and so, right. to answer your question, anybody that's been mentioned knows they owe me a thank you for not saying everything else I could have said, but that I chose not to. And it wasn't because I owe them anything. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that there'd be many opportunities to talk in press if I wanted to elaborate. But right. writing a book, if, if someone hasn't done it, it's, I, I think we've all written a school paper or mm -hmm. like, hopefully, you know, and there has to be a certain balance and, and flow. And um, I told, and we, when you read it, you'll find out, I told a beautiful story and, and it, it makes you feel good when you're done reading it. It makes you feel good. It's, it, it, makes, it makes you um, hopeful for the future. It makes you um, understand, you know, that you're, we're all human. No mm -hmm. one's better than anyone else. And yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we all have our crosses to bear. And it's a survival story. And it's also, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. And I don't think it came out that way. Um, I think it's a love story. And I think it's a haunted love story. It's, yeah. it, it's sad at times, but I also found the humor in every situation. And what I've been told, you know, by other um, people that have interviewed me is that basically you feel good after you read it. And that's, that's what I wanted. I wanted everybody to feel good. I didn't want smutty stories distracting from my journey because the person that I am, I have a good attitude. I feel good yeah. about everything. Not every moment of the day, but I have to process those emotions right, right. and get rid of them somewhere else. They don't all belong in a memoir, you know? Right, right. Um, 
Lori asks, uh, does she like bald guys, which actually really means, um, does she ship books to Australia? What? <laughs> Lori asked if I like bald guys. Is there it's a lot of bald a, guys? Lori, Lori is a guy in Australia. Oh. Yes, I do strip. I, I strip. I strip in Australia. No, I. If I would have been to ever been to Australia, maybe. <laughs> do you ship? Yes, I do ship to Australia. All right, cool. There you go. But Australia is more expensive to ship to, but I do do it. Yep. Well, I, I, I actually charge one price on my website for international. Whether you're in Canada or Australia, twenty or thirty-five dollars for me. Yeah. I just take it off the top of my price because it's it's was just easier to build the website that way absolutely. so absolutely yes and absolutely. i haven't had any australian offers uh, offers uh, i can't even speak anymore are you drinking jack daniels as well yeah, no uh bush mills and a kid <laughs> and how what, what's the response been from your family about the book jesus christ <laughs> we talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday over happy hour. Yeah, I know. You made sure I was drinking before you asked me that question. <laughs> well, no, because I, I didn't know how deep we talked about it a little bit over happy hour. I don't know how much you want to get into it. Um, you said we might bring it up. We might not. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's sad, but I, I, as I told you yesterday when we were hanging out, I edited my life story. I censored my entire existence to make my sister happy mm -hmm. um out of respect and what i found out in a very short time um is that i shouldn't have done that i i it was it's my story no one else's and the respect that i got in return for that it was zilch was no appreciation um as a matter of fact it was she's the only person on the face of the planet i haven't even got a troller not a hater not a stranger not not one person saying one bad thing. Only the person who I agreed not to, even though I'll, okay. I didn't say anything hurtful at all. The things that I would have said had I not censored myself were not even about her. They would have been about my relationship with my mother. She protects my mother. So she asked me not to say anything bad about my mom. So I didn't, in a million years, I didn't think I'd have anything bad to say about my sister, yet she was the first to attack me about this. So I've learned things from this, and anybody, and I've had a few friends that I grew up with now, people thinking everybody's got a story in them. We all, we all have a story. It's a matter of sitting down and writing it. So every, everybody has an interesting story. Everyone's life is yeah. interesting. So I might have had a little bit of an easier time getting it out than someone else that self-published because I already had an audience. I know, but everybody has a good story. And I've been telling my friends, don't make the mistake I did and write it for you. Do not do any favors for your sister or your mother or anybody else uh, because they're the, going to be the first ones to turn on you. So that's, a, that, that is what happened to me. And it's, and, and it's upsetting because my story is, I have a great book. It's great, but it would yeah. have been a lot more interesting had I not edited and edited and ever smoothed over the parts that might have been slightly offensive to my mother. And I only did that for my sister. There's nothing bad in it about my sister. So what did I do wrong? I, 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 I don't know. So the, you know what, you, you just sometimes you, you can't, you, no matter what you do, you can't make anyone happy. You can't make everyone happy. You can't make anyone happy. So just be true to yourself. And yeah. you, you, you're born alone, you die alone. It sounds yep. harsh. It sounds harsh, but in the end of the day, you're born alone, you die alone, and it's my story. So I yeah. should not have catered to my sister's wishes. I shouldn't have edited out anything. And it, it should have, uh, there were certain things in there I told her I couldn't change, like why I wanted to be famous, because my mother said she didn't like me. I wanted to prove her wrong my whole life by proving if other people like me, my mother must be wrong. So if I'm famous, then I'm liked. So that cannot be taken out of the book because that is the story right. of how I developed into who I am today. But right. yes, I don't have to talk about what a raven fucking alcoholic, fucking bipolar lunatic she was. I kept right. all that out. I, I well, didn't tell any, any of my um, family secrets. I didn't bash anybody. But yet I'm treated as if I did. So I might as well have. Carrie, you know, it's funny. This is another thing that, you know, that that we kind of roll on the same page with. Um, one of the reasons that I do what I do is to prove not my mother wrong, because my mother has always been supportive, but everybody else, you know, 
everybody else that because oh, I, I was the bully kid in school, God. and uh, so it's like it, it's like I guess I do what I do to prove them all wrong. Oh, the kids at school. Yeah. Were Were you like? Um, uh, see, I had it both ways. Like I was most popular in school, like the voted most popular, best right. dressed in Massachusetts. But then I was kicked out, and my senior year I had to go to Memphis the biggest high school richest high school in Tennessee and nobody talked to me like no, like I well I no one knew me I was kicked right. out as a senior so I went from going to being the most popular girl to being the dork that no one would speak to nobody knew me I was so lonely so I know I know how I I know it both ways. Like I I know how it feels to be an outcast. I know how it feels to be the most popular. I know it both ways. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, okay, back to the, <laughs> this should be the name of this show. Let me ask you this. Not a bad title, actually. I like that. It's very simple. Had had you not met Eric, had uh, that time in your life not happened, do you think you would be where you are today? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, why? Oh, you don't go fucking make me cry again, Jesus. No, I, I'm not trying to make you cry. Um, no, but you just made me flash back to this time when I went to Eric's apartment on Larrabee in Hollywood, and Kiss used to put him up there when they were recording, mm -hmm. and um, I went there. I was sitting on his couch with him, and I announced to him I was moving back to Memphis. I was going to leave LA and go back to college. And he said, why? And I was always too embarrassed to admit to him that I had problems and I was broke, you know? So yeah. I told him I can't afford to be here anymore. I can't do it. I, I, I admitted to him that I don't even have a refrigerator. Like I, and you know what? The next day he had a refrigerator we went to Sears.com. He not got to come. He went to Sears, whatever he called, wait, 800 or he's ordered me a refrigerator. Yeah. There was a refrigerator. I had a refrigerator the next day. His wow. gross, his accountant back then, $25 a week was enough for groceries for one person. He got yeah. his accountant, his accountant started sending me $25 a week until the day he died after that. Oh, um, God. And yeah. Every time Eric went to an ATM, took money out for me. He asked me, what do you really want to do with your life? What people wonder why I'm still loyal to him after all these years. I'll tell you why. Who does that for you? He said, what can I do to help you? He said, what do you really want to do with your life? And I was shy to admit it because the small town I come from, you don't say you want to be an actress or a model. You get laughed out of town. Right. So I admitted to him that that's what I wanted to do. And he said, what can I do to help you? He didn't say, he didn't say like my grandparents, you better have a backup plan. You can't do right. it. You know, all he did was help me. He said, what can I do to help you? And he paid the fees for me to get into SAG and AFTRA. We went down the list of the goals that I needed to achieve to reach my ultimate goal. Um, he would go to my auditions with me. When he was on tour with KISS, I, this, I, before email, I would fax to the hotel my sides from my auditions and on tour instead of hanging out like down in the bar afterwards, he'd be up in his room practicing my lines with me. Oh, uh, dude, that's a, that's a guess. That's a, is this stuff in the book? Hmm? Is that stuff in the book? I don't think that is in the book. I don't think that part is in the book, no. But a little bit of it is. I mean, about SAG after, I know I might, like yeah. I said, like, it's, it's very difficult as a writer to know when to end my book. Cause every time I read my right. book, I'm like, Oh, I forgot about this. And I have to add this or I should with that. And like, you know, there's so many details and then eventually I had to just go, you know what? You're done. There will be other opportunities like me yeah. talking to you right now. There's things that pop in my head that I didn't pop in my head at the time I was writing the book. There's so much. Right. Right. Um, after, after Eric, Eric passed, um, what was your mindset? What was um, career-wise? I mean, how hard was it to to move forward? I mean, obviously, without the man that you will love forever, you know. Well, and obviously, we can tell you I that. Think, but I think I would have been a huge star had Eric stayed alive. Okay. I had I had 
Well, we were a team. We were a good team. Mm -hmm. And I had someone there for me in my corner and he, you know what? This is, I think this is in the book. Um, this means so much to me. I remember when he came up to my first audition with me. I remember that series, Parker Lewis Can't Lose. And yeah. Yeah, it was on the Fox. So that was my first like big audition and Eric Carr from Kids. Like uh, now I look back, oh, oh, it probably looked weird to people that I was walking with him, but he was just my boyfriend. But he, he came with me you know, to the lot and Century City and I auditioned and then I didn't get it. And I remember him, when I found out I didn't get it, I told him and I said, you know, maybe I just wasn't pretty enough. And, and he said, you could never not be pretty enough. And to this day, Every time I've walked into an audition to this day, I walk in, you could never not be pretty enough. You could never not be pretty. And I don't, I don't even look at other girls. I don't think about competition. It doesn't distract me because I have that mantra. You could never not be pretty enough. You could never not be pretty enough. And I don't focus on anything else. I focus on the work. I do my scene and I'm out. And I just, uh, I, thanks to Eric, that's why he's, I say when he still walks with me, he's still living with me today. All of the things that he said to me, back then are still helping me today. Like he's still with me. And he, he's, he, I, and I know I, I, I sound stuck on him and I am, and I'm, I'm done um, trying to pretend I'm not, but what an amazing person I had in my life. Yeah. What an amazing person I had that was, had such a significant, significant positive influence on me while he was alive that I can't forget about him 30 days, 30 years later. I'm right. so, yeah, and that, and but, next year. Uh, yeah, he, he's, he's still helping me. His words still help me all these years later, he's gone. And it's, you know, it, that's why I say had he stayed around, you know, we could have conquered the world together, you know, mm -hmm. How no long? My mind, whether he was in kiss or not in kiss, he would have been right. successful again. And he would have helped me to be as successful as I could have been. But after he died, I was such a fucking train wreck. I just cried all the time. I mean, I went to auditions and I would just start bawling my eyes out to the casting director. And my manager eventually said, you know, you're not ready, Carrie. You need to take some time off. And I did some plays in LA, one, one, one five drama log words. I co-produced it. I threw myself into my work. Um, and oh, I'm still mad about this. My manager uh, got a call from someone at Fox that came to one of my plays. And it was when they were casting Melrose Place. And, um, they wanted to, they saw me in the play and wanted me to come direct to producers for it. And she said, she's not ready. She went through, you know, a difficult loss and she's not ready. And I'm going, why the fuck did you, I didn't find out until years later. Right. And I'm going, why the fuck did you say I wasn't ready? That could have been part of my healing had I gotten onto like a big show and had something yeah, to absolutely. dive into. Absolutely. But yeah. She turned it down and said I wasn't ready. Like, anyway, it, it yeah, it feels like after I lost him, nothing was ever easy again. Yeah. Let me ask you this. This, this is a weird fanboy geek kiss question. Um, had, er had Eric lived and stayed in the band, uh, reunion still happens in 1996. Peter ends up leaving and Eric gets the call to come back. Um, does he come back? And if they say... I don't think he would have. I think he would have been treated like Bruce Kulick. Really? Because Bruce Absolutely. said he was never contacted about it. Well, they, they, I, I've never understood that. I love Tommy too, but Bruce, yeah. but Bruce was the original member. So why did they replace him with Tommy? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I know that Gene liked Tommy a lot, but they also love Bruce. So I, I, right, I, right. I, I, I'm not the person to ask about that. Well, look, look, I, I guess I guess this is this is the weird question. Um, if they had contact, if say he hadn't died, I mean, this is this is all what ifs. Uh, no, no, but, but okay, you have to understand that Paul already couldn't stand Eric. He already right, had a right. With him. He did want Eric Singer in the band. So, what I whether it's not about talent or okay. anything else. Okay. If Eric had gotten well, or if he had never gotten sick, I don't believe. Why should we believe he would have been treated? any differently than Bruce Kulik. So you don't, so you don't think what, conflict with the band. So you, you don't think after those years, at, after, after 96, or, or even if Eric had replaced Eric around revenge, say it did happen. 
Um, in the 2000s, Eric would not have got the call to come back. I three- think it would have been. I think it would have been if, if Gene and Paul thought it would have made them more money to have Eric yeah. Carr, and they would have brought Eric Carr back. Do right. I think emotionally, like that's why they brought uh, Ace and Peter back? Oh, the yeah. reunion! It'll bring us more money, not because they oh, like yeah. him, those people. Oh, yeah. It was a business decision. So that's why I say no. He would have been treated like Bruce Kulick. It would have been right. all business. Um, I don't think that. Um, look. Like I said, I told you, I don't think Paul even understands the emotion empathy. He didn't like Eric. He didn't stop to think, what's Eric going through? Mm -hmm. What is Eric feeling right now? And should I try to put myself in his shoes? He didn't do that. He was cutthroat. And that's why I, I, I don't, Gene back then acted that way, but I think Paul was the one behind it. And like they, those two are a marriage. They have yeah. to agree on everything, and that's yep. why it's worked. So, yeah. and I, but I, I heard the conversations. I saw what was going on. Paul was different than Gene. Gene did try to understand Eric's moods. Eric had them. He wasn't. It's very fucking unfair. In Paul's yeah. book, he goes on to say Eric was moody. It's like, dude, your nickname was Phyllis on the road for a reason. Right. Right. Okay. Your PMS shown through, and you didn't even have cancer. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, I just find him extremely, not to go off on him again, but like he's got like a sensitivity chip missing. There is something missing. Mm -hmm. So when I heard Rachel talking about psychological problems and things before, um, come on, a psychiatrist was running the kiss office. Oh, by the way, that guy's wanted by the FBI now. He's still, like, <laughs> Holy yeah, shit. My, this is not allegedly, this is actually yeah, true. Jack Hilson, no, he stole like $3 million from the Hot in the Shade tour, and he's like most wanted FBI, like he's in hiding. Je- Jesus Jess, Christ. Jess, J-E-S-S-E, Hilson, I think it's H-I-L-S-O-N. It's no secret, you can Google it. Okay, so here is the really weird question that I was going to get at at the end of it. So had... They brought him back. Like they have Eric Singer in Peter's makeup and they were, they said, yes, you were the Fox, but now because we want the classic oh, I look, don't, would don't he care. have wore Peter's makeup? I don't think you would have. Eric was a little Caesar and I don't think he would have done it. And furthermore, I don't think the fans would have been receptive. I think that right. would have been a terrible business move. And I, I don't think Gene and Paul, there's only one way Eric would have been back in the band instead of Eric Singer. And is that, and I don't know this, you'll probably know more than me. If their relationship with Peter Chris was just so bad that they took Eric Carr back, that would have been natural because Eric Carr had a character and some makeup. So it would have been so blatant to take Eric Singer and put him in um, Peter's uh, the cat makeup when the Fox was still alive, I don't think the fans would have, and hey, if I get that, so did Jean and Paul, they would have had right, to. Right, right. So, and Eric would have never agreed to wear the cat makeup, and which doesn't even make any fucking sense. Like, no, I agree, but it's just, it's just one of those weird what if questions. It's like, what, no, what it, 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 it wouldn't have happened. It, Eric wouldn't have let it happen. Said. Eric was a badass. Like, Eric yeah. stood up for himself. Yeah. Eric was, a pretty tough guy. Yeah. He, 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 he wasn't, um, he didn't, he didn't play it safe. He wasn't like, you know, I love Bruce more than anything. He's yeah. Family. Bruce is amazing. So Bruce, 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 Bruce is absolutely the sweetest person in the world, but it's thanks to Bruce that, you know, parts of my book are toned down. Like I told you, cause he's yeah. like, Terry, don't say this about Paul Jimmy tone it. Cause that's, that's his style. But yeah. Eric was more like me, like where we're, we're more like we, or East Coast, well, versus the US. But you know, like we just tell it like we see it, you know, like we, yeah. we don't have, we're not saying anything um, to protect anyone else or to hurt anyone else. We're just yeah. calling it like we see it. And that was, uh, Eric would have called it like he saw it, um, like I do. So, how and, did, did you ever talk, did you ever have conversations with him about? playing the old songs and about how he played the old songs no not really okay okay because no, eric, eric and i our relationship was so 
boyfriend, girlfriend, personal. Okay. We, all right. We all right. Talk, we didn't sit around and talk about how you mix the song. I mean, when we were at the studio, we last fall, I was, we were in the bathroom fucking all the time. You know, like, uh, we were what couples do. Nice. We, weren't, we weren't discussing, like, the, the tracks. We were in the bathroom fucking. That's what we were supposed to be doing. It wasn't, it wasn't my job to, you know, lay out the tracks. God bless him. Carrie, if people want to get the book, they want to get the autographed copy, please uh, give that out one more time. Uh, well, here you go, Carrie. You, if you're on Amazon, you have to search specifically under the books tab or you won't find it. So click on the books tab and then unrated Revelations of a Rock and Roll Centerfold by Carrie Stevens. If you want the easy way out, if you want to do that, just go to carriestevens.com. I have the Amazon link right there. You can buy VIP packages for signed autographs and signs both hard and soft there. Hard and soft. This sounds so perverted all of a sudden, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. You can get it hard or you can get it soft. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you want it hard, you go to Barnes and Noble because they definitely have it hard. And if they want to get an autograph through that, that all that shit is available. CarrieStevens.com. CarrieStevens.com. Do it, Carrie. And if people want to find you, it's Carrie Stevens XO. At Twitter, Carrie Stevens XO at uh, Instagram, and then. Facebook, I just have a fan page, Carrie Stevens. Carrie, this has been a blast. You know you are always welcome. I, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to hit my, we're actually, we're going to, the, the actual outro to this show is Animalized Live Uncensored. The Black Diamond outro. Oh. You know, Eric used to sing Black Diamond on tour. Yes, he um, did. That makes it even I, I Last time I saw Kiss in Scotland, Paul was attempting it, and I fucking walked out. I was like, oh, he's butchering this. It was so bad, I had to leave. I, on that note, Black Diamond is one of my favorite Kiss songs. I love so many Kiss songs. Like, I Was Made for Loving You is probably, I have to say, people always ask me my top favorite Kiss song. I can never pick one. Um, well, written by one Desmond Child, who is also on my dream. We, we briefly talked about him last night, and I have not had a chance yet to get in touch with him because I want to brag that I got that's to all talk good. to him. Yeah, but I, that's on our list. Next time we talk, we're going to talk about Desmond. Absolutely. Talking. Cheers up. This is to the late, great Eric Carr. To the late, great Eric Carr. And Gary. it'll be the, this November 24th, it will be 29 years. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, always, it sucks that I always got buried because Freddie Mercury died on the same day. Uh, and, and I, I, Eric, that I can see Eric's face laughing and rolling his eyes about that too, because that would be like that's his sense of humor. Of course. Of course. Was, was Eric a Queen fan? Was, was, that, was, was Eric a Queen fan? Would that make it even yeah, he was a funny queen in his, in his he mind? Was a queen fan. He was a Queen fan. But you know, he had this self deprecating sense of humor that. Like he used to always, I can't stand it today when anyone uses the word doomed because it, it brings back the memories, but just to give you a, a taste of his sense of humor, like we'd just be driving around or something and he never felt sorry for himself while he was having cancer, but he'd laugh about it. He'd go, we're doomed. Like in the cartoons, you know, like Scooby-Doo, yeah, yeah. we're doomed, we're doomed. Eric would always say, we're doomed. So I have a, oh my God, so it triggers something. And whenever anyone says we're doomed today, I'm like, don't say that. Because when Eric would joke about it and say we're doomed, I didn't really think we were doomed, but we were. It was he, he always joked about everything. Yeah, that, that was his personality. We, we never talked about are you gonna die? Like it just didn't right. come up. We 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 still were having a good time, and I think that fans need to know that, and I think it makes them feel better yeah. knowing that he had someone like me with him to the end, and that we were still laughing and still having fun as much as we could until it's a sad story in the book told it just wasn't physically possible anymore. Yeah. Well, I hope you got to relive, relive some fun times tonight as well, because that, that's what it's all about. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, everybody buy the book and I'll, I'll put it up one more time. Hit up on Amazon, hit up Carrie's website, all that kind of good stuff. You will find it. 
And uh, my name is Izzy Presley, and I'm going to restart this one more time just because of the beautiful outro music and the great Eric Carr is playing. Oh, and because I interrupted you, so just say No, it. no, but hey, hey I'm, all, I'm all right with that. Jeff Rowe Lee Ross says, rock on. Scotty Strickland says, uh, thank you both for another great show. Uh, Lori from Australia says, uh, that's fucking beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Carrie. Fucking great interview. God bless Lori. God bless that motherfucker. And apparently we have to get tag team championship belts. No. Um, hit up all the social media at Real Izzy Presley all the way across the board. Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course the show page is another effing podcast. You can buy shit like these amazing Izzy Presley pants for only $44.95. I believe is the price. I don't make that. Teespring makes it. because. Are they for women too? No, they are for women. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like, well, I just bought them because it would be hilarious. And I have sold a couple pairs, by the way. I washed the t-shirt you gave me. I was going to wear it on the show tonight, but it's still in the dryer. I didn't have time. Sorry. It's so after you read my book, I'll come back on and I'll wear your shirt. And I love it. We'll get you back on at one of the drunken summits. Uh, if you want to donate, Izzy Presley at Yahoo.com. That's the easy PayPal. We'll see you next Tuesday comparing Dynasty and Kiss Unmasked. It is another fucking podcast. Don't forget, I do love you all. And what I lack in talent, I make up for in cock. <laughs> Boom.